Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, June 12th, 2023 at 7 p.m. here at Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public and the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, please call roll. Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis is absent. Member Hannes is absent. Member Harris is absent. Member Olchek. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board on, uh, later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed at the basket over there to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes for public comment tonight, so uh, we ask that everyone keep their comments to three minutes. All right, we're going to start off as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Next on tonight's agenda is a public hearing for the proposed 2022 to 2023 amended budget. Uh, so if Todd Drayfall, I'd like to step up. It says here you'd like to make a brief comment before I open it up. This is the uh, standard uh, hearing uh, for budget. Uh, we have to follow the same procedures for amended budget as we do for when the district has its initial budget. Uh, the board saw a presentation and it, uh, of the, of the bud amended budget last month. It's been on display for 30 days. We published notice. And so this would be the hearing for any comment on the amended budget. Of course, uh, we are doing so because uh, the district passed a referendum, issued bonds, and we are working on our capital, which you will see a pr uh, presentation later on with. And so that's the reason, main reason for the amended budget. Thank okay. you very much. All right, so at this time, I declare the hearing open to allow members of the audience to comment on this topic. Anyone wishing to be heard, please stand, state your name, attendance area, and organization, if any, off of the record. So anyone, if you want to, please stand up to the podium. All right, there are no comments. I now declare the hearing, uh, the hearing closed at 7.02 p.m. All right, we have some non-action items. The first thing up is our communications. Listed on tonight's agenda are four communications received by the board. Are there any other communications that board member would like to share at this time? No. Okay, and that brings us to the spotlight on our schools with the spring data snapshot. Welcome, Mr. Sissel. Good evening. Tonight is truly a snapshot, the data that we're reviewing we've had uh, access to for about a week and a half, and so we're going to start with a high-level overview of our spring Ames Web and Map data and some initial interpretations. We want to remember, too, that with, through our partnership with ECRA and looking at all of the data that's available, it'll really be October when we can finalize this year's overall results, including the state testing as well, and that's when we really look to our KPI analysis as a district. As always, we want to recognize that all data provide us an opportunity to look at areas of growth and areas that we want to further investigate, both at the highest and most individual level. And then finally, new this spring, we're going to add onto this data snapshot uh, an overview of the spring 2023 climate survey data as well. Highest level impressions. The first thing we'll see in the ECRA report is that at, in, in the aggregate level, at the district level, we are entirely within the expected growth range, which means that our systems are doing what they're supposed to be doing. We're continuing to see high achievement in our map data across all grade levels. Our Ames Web data is showing performance consistent with our pre-pandemic levels, where we never expect to see everyone in that green, but we expect to see most or many, and that's what we are seeing. And we're going to look at some subgroup data that's actually really kind of exciting based on in some places that we've been recently. We're also going to acknowledge that within our map data, when we look at it by grade levels, we see some lower than and, and when what Eckford terms unsatisfactory growth numbers. The majority of our schools across the board are in the expected growth range with one or two exceptions. And as we get into the, the mathematics data, one reminder <coughs> is that our double accelerated fourth grade students and our single accelerated fifth grade students were administered this year the math map six plus assessment because they are testing off grade level 
they aren't factored into the ECRA growth model. It's something we learned, we mentioned this in the winter, it's something we learned about the ECRA model and that decision. The decision to give them that assessment has to do with mirroring the content they're learning with the assessment they're receiving. It's a decision we're in the process of reevaluating for the coming year because we weren't anticipating the inability to track the, the math growth of those students in this way because of that assessment. So this chart has been consistent for many, many years as we just take a look at one moment in time based on our spring testing. We look across the board at, at, at mean percentiles, median percentiles, and then the third column in, in both reading and math is the achievement percentile. And as a reminder, that's how we can compare ourselves to MAPS national norms and where we um, rank, so to speak, based on those assessments. And as I mentioned, still all of those well above the 80th percentile. We're seeing a couple of the means and medians a little bit lower, perhaps, than we did in the spring, a little, a few more 60s than 70s, and, and perhaps, and that's something we'll kind of talk about as the presentation goes on, where our spring data sits in relation to some of our winter data and some factors that might influence that. But generally speaking, this slide demonstrates continued strong performance from an achievement perspective based on NWEA map. As we look at our Ames Web numbers, again, this is the early literacy composite for our kindergarten students in the spring. And we usually look to the far right to see that large number of students in the green, which puts them at low risk for, for need of additional support. Again, statistically, we're always going to see some students in the yellow and the red, but these numbers equate to our pre-pandemic numbers, generally speaking, and you'll see as we get to first grade, they come down even a little bit further. Early numeracy, again, consistent performance with, uh, with a, a slightly higher level of students falling into the green, which is what we've seen over the past several years as we've begun administering this assessment. Early literacy in first grade, again, as we're seeing, you know, a, 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 an, again, strong performance of students moving into that low risk category. And then similarly with early numeracy in, in first grade. One of the things that is new to us is that the ECRA model now incorporates the Ames Web data for both reading and math. And so just as we've done with, with minimizing some of the, the map graphs and charts over the past few years, in future presentations we may simply move to incorporating this in ECRA's growth and achievement model as we look at that. These slides are reminders for people who might be new to our um, data presentations, but for all of us that have been through this at the board level and on, and on our team, a reminder of how ECRA calculates growth and, and what it looks at basically creating that individual target for a student once per year and then looking at the distance between that target and the student's actual performance. This is a reminder about growth scores and effect size, which again acknowledges that we really are looking at that difference between what the prediction was and what the actual number was. And you can be below the actual the prediction and still show growth. So a, a negative number in an ECRA model is not regression. A negative number simply means distance from the target that was established. <clears throat> and as a reminder, this is ECRA's color coding system. So everything green is within that expected growth range. Blue or yellow is, is one step higher or lower than. And then when we see red, that's now two standard deviations below expected growth, which ECRA wants to call attention to, and they, they therefore use the term unsatisfactory. So as we begin, this slide will always tell us what are the criteria that are being referenced. So you can see in kindergarten and first grade, we're seeing Ames Web, early numeracy, and early literacy, as well as MAP. And then when we reach second grade, the, the rest of the data is exclusively a reference of our spring MAP assessments. And again, as I mentioned, when we look at all subjects across the district, in the upper right, the first thing we see is we are, we are green there. We are within the expected growth range. And that's, that's consistent for all of our schools across the district as we look down our 13 buildings. Some slightly above that expected growth number, a few slightly below that expected growth number, but again, from an ECRA perspective, certainly well within the expected growth range in the aggregate across all schools. When we break that down first into math, we see that we remain in the expected growth range. A little more, you know, a negative 0.14 is a little further away from zero or from the positive number that we'd like to see overall. You'll notice O'Neill in this case is, is, is the yellow dot in this case where they are the lower than expected growth school for mathematics. I can tell you having sat in on O'Neill's instructional leadership team conversation last week as they're building next year's school improvement plan, that's, that's a number they're taking very seriously. You know, we did put some things in place after the winter data conversation and so there was a lot of reflection on what did that look like? What can we learn from it? Did we do the right things? Did we do them soon enough? You know, at the end of the day, it was probably six to eight weeks of 
additional support and intervention between the time we analyzed that data, worked on a plan, and implemented it. There are, you know, when we start to analyze at the individual student level, there are certainly some good things happening, and so the team has already talked about scaling some of those up to all students and some more frequency for targeted students in the coming years. So while we didn't at O'Neill necessarily see that change in growth that we might have hoped for, I think that it's led to some continued really good, honest, reflective conversations about what kinds of specific goals we need to have for next year, not just about the implementation of things, but about really those strategies and what supports we're putting in place for students. In reading, actually, before we go on from math, absolutely. can you help me understand the accelerated placement? I think it was like the second to last bullet of the, the first slide. Are we taking them out of this equation then? So when uh, it'll, I'll, when we, can I do that when we get to the grade level slide? It'll be easier to help with that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Reading across buildings again, overall in the expected growth, much closer to kind of right on the line, which if you'll recall, last spring our reading data was not it was, was a little further off in many buildings, which led to some zip lows for this year in a lot of buildings that did focus on reading and literacy. Henry Puffer is our yellow dot there. If you notice, it's negative 0.31, so while it does fall into the lower than expected category, it's, it's a 0 0.002 difference between being yellow and green. Certainly a conversation that's being had by the Henry Puffer instructional leadership team and the principal there and really looking at you know, how were our goals implemented last year? Were they the right goals? And what do we need to do to really target some of those pieces next year? But again, not, not so far off of that green dot as we look across the board. So this is the slide that we'll, we'll focus on a couple of things. So first, let's acknowledge this is the first time in our use of ECRA that we have seen red dots at the district level for an area. And um, you know, so what do, we, what, do we, what do we do with that? Well, first we need to take a look at it and figure out what is, what is causing that and what does that look like. And I'm gonna go into that a little more in some subsequent slides. But Steve, to the question you asked, if you look at the student count column, and you start looking down from kindergarten, the, the number of students, this is gonna be the number of students who have a propensity score and therefore we are able to include in this analysis. And so generally speaking, that's awfully close to the number of students that we have at the given grade level. When you look at fifth grade, that number drops by over 100 compared to what we actually have in terms of enrolled fifth graders. And so that fifth grade number represents all of the fifth grade students who are receiving math instruction at the fifth grade level. But if they are accelerated, either single or double, then they were administered the MAP assessment, which is a signal. The MAP assessment breaks into K2 for math, 2-5, and then 6 plus. And so we as a district last year, after many, after conversations and analysis of what the test does, had said for those students who are accelerated into sixth grade or beyond, regardless of their, their age-based grade level, we would administer the MAP 6 plus test. It's just a, a click of a button on the computer screen. The content in the 2-5 assessment is all embedded in the 6 plus test. The 6 plus test takes them further and tests them on some of the additional concepts they may be encountering as well as some of those beyond. So that decision is, is, is well aligned with NWEA guidance. What we learned this year as these numbers came back is that ECRA doesn't have a mechanism to place the students who tested off grade level into their algorithm and, and all of that. And so essentially the fifth grade number is lacking the students who are accelerated or double accelerated. The fourth grade number will be missing the handful of fourth grade students, not handful, but the smaller number of fourth grade students who are double accelerated. And so where you see that reflected where I could say, well, that the impact is recognizable when you look at the percentage that met the benchmark column, right? That's the percentage that are, are correlated to receive a four or a five on the IAR based on their performance. If you take off the, the top end achievers, it, it stands to reason that then, yes, we might see less of a percentage of this group meeting the benchmark because the students who are likely to meet that benchmark are likely in that high achieving group. I also, I, we, don't, we can't really use that as an exact correlation for what impacts the growth numbers because the growth really should be all students across the board. So we have to be careful that we acknowledge that, but we don't over acknowledge it. These, these, these red dots in fourth and fifth grade are something we certainly need to look at. And I am gonna go into some further detail and some subsequent slides about what we've already done and what we plan to do in those areas. Um, when we look at reading by grade level, again, we see a story of consistent expected growth across the board. And again, this wasn't necessarily the case last spring, so this is, I, I would attribute some of this to a focus of instructional leadership teams and school improvement plans on some specific targeted literacy strategies that we are you know, beginning to see take hold in many of our buildings. 
Across subgroups in mathematics, again, we see a couple of yellow dots here, but very close to green in all of those. The, the subgroup gaps are really are minimal in, in mathematics, which is exciting. When we look at reading, which is actually where you will more typically see gaps within subgroups, I think this slide is, is, a, is a point of pride in this data set in that we are seeing all of our subgroups in the expected growth range and the, and the actual gaps between subgroups and the groups of students that don't um, carry that characteristic are, are really very statistically small in this case. So again, this is a case of seeing hopefully the interventions and things like that that we've been putting in place in supports are, are doing their jobs and are bringing those, those growth gaps to, to a closure. So again, we received this data on June 1st. This was also the first time that all certified staff had an ECRA login. So we were able to do some building level and team level and grade level analysis as part of our, our spring look. Again, we've had only a couple hours in earnest for those groups to look at it, but they've begun the process of bringing this down to the student level and saying, okay, what does my, what does my grade level at my school look like in these two content areas and what does that mean for individual student performance? Obviously at the district level, we're gonna spend some time looking at the things that pop right away, that's our, that's our first thing. And so we focused on some of those yellow and red pieces. I've mentioned a couple of this, the instructional leadership team meetings. Each building's instructional leadership team meets for half a day in June, around now, and then another half a day in August when we have the remainder of the data that we wanna to review to really get, um, first to reflect on this year's school improvement plan and, and what that looked like, which we'll be sharing the, the final version with reflection with the board in the next few weeks. And then also to start planning for next year's instructional planning based on this data and, what, and, and other information that we have so we can really begin that process. Again, in August, they'll have IAR data incorporated so the, in the ECRA model, so we'll, we'll be able to include that as part of the conversation as well. But at the district level, again, when we see some of those things, here's so fourth and fifth grade math data being a, a valley in a moment, I will, you know, some of you will, I know Tracy and Darren will remember one of my first or several of my first meetings in this position for me focused on intermediate math and why we were seeing a consistency of lower performance. So I, this, I will admit, gave, gave me a little bit of pause because we hadn't been seeing it. So the first thing, and I realize this is hard to see, but this is all of the ECRA data we've had at starting at the left side of the screen last spring, bottom is this fall, upper right is this winter. And so I share this at only because all I'm really drawing your attention to is the colors. Fourth and fifth grade have been well comfortably in the expected growth range every time we've had ECRA data. So the first thing to acknowledge is that does make this a little bit of an anomaly, not something we ignore, but something we contextualize to say this hasn't been an ongoing problem. So something's different at this moment, and then, then we have to start to figure out what, what is that. You know, last, last year, we were spending a lot of professional learning time focusing on math sequentially, but with grade levels, a lot of um, time spent unpacking units and making sure we kind of had everything in sequence. So one of the things that we investigated right after receiving this information was where were we in terms of pacing when this assessment was given. One of the things we've added this year is we, we now have a, a centralized system in which teachers enter the math assessment data that we're doing through Bridges in grades K through five. And so we have a better sense, it may not be perfect, but we have a better sense of where each building is based on which assessments they've given at that moment in time. So this next slide unpacks that a little bit. Based upon our scope and sequence, if everyone was right on time, we would probably expect people to be somewhere around unit seven or beginning unit eight in the second week of May. So this data shows by each sort of grouping where the grade level at a given building was in terms of the top one is who's within or still within unit five, who's in unit six, who's just completed unit six, and so forth. And then the color coding is where their growth color was by building at those grade levels. And again, the number then within the cell is how many buildings were at that point. So just as the upper left example, there were three buildings in which the fourth grade was still within or just completed unit five. And so while I'm not gonna say this is the only answer, there certainly is an initial relationship. There are a couple of outliers to the, to the green and blue in the top group, but as you move down, you certainly see far more green and blue than you do yellow and red, depending on how far we've gotten. I wanna be very careful in how we think about this and talk about this. 
schools because there's not a teacher in District 58 who is going to say, I'm just going to stop teaching right now because I don't feel like moving forward. Like it's, it, these are all extraordinarily well-intentioned decisions around responsiveness to student learning. I'm, I'm confident that the, the slowdown is, I don't feel like they've gotten it yet. We need to spend some more time. We need to dig in a little further. We need to add some things. And that is a good tool to have in your toolbox, to pause, to reflect, to look at the data you have, to look at your student's performance in the class and, and see what's there. The, the question becomes, did that work or is that our only tool? And how do we, how do we balance that, that human solid instructor need of, I wanna make sure they've got it before we move too far on with the recognition of some of those skills will come back around in subsequent years and the benefit for growth may be in the exposure to more material mm -hmm. at some level than it is into the mastery of all material. And that, that's a constant equilibrium we try to find in education. So this isn't a question of bad teaching or non-responsiveness to district expectations. It's a question of decisions that were made thoughtfully and now reflecting as we go into next year about when we made those decisions and how we can think about making those decisions but keeping some of this information as part of that decision-making process as well. So again, not a comprehensive analysis that says this is why some grades are some colors and some aren't at the district level, but certainly a, a point of analysis for us to consider as we begin having instructional conversations next year. Do, so we, again, do we track that on a regular basis? So again, this is, so do we track it in, the, where we pulled this information from is the system that is new for all K-5 teachers as of this year, which is a central place that we are tracking year over year student assessment data, which helps us just to kind of get a sense of based on which assessment you have plugged in at that time. Now, is it possible that a teacher at that moment had given the assessment but hadn't put the data in and waited a couple, it, it is possible. So that's why I say this isn't necessarily, I don't want to, I want to be careful about the level of precision here, but it's, it's a, we are now, yes, having K-5 teachers enter this data and map, and it's a system that we like, and so we're looking toward continuing as we look at new curricular resources, finding ways to, to bring that together. Because it also helps us have system-wide conversations, not just about things like pacing, but about specific concepts of instruction. Justin, what are the colors being here? The colors correlate to the ECRA color for growth in, in spring. So if you're looking at a red cell, that means to, to stick with my upper left example. So in grade four, those three buildings who were in unit five at that point in time, all were red for growth. Whereas if you scroll across to the right in that same row, there is one fourth grade who was in unit five who had a green growth indicator from ECRA. So again, the fall gives us the chance to really pull everything together with IAR, which doesn't necessarily impact K-1-2, but certainly does impact our upper grades. Um, we're eager to see those, those numbers, both from a growth and achievement perspective, inside the ECRA model. We don't have public access or final data yet, but some of the early initial data we have indicates that there may be some complementary data sets in some of these places to some of the places we're seeing a, a few valleys in our spring map data. So that really will be the, the comprehensive analysis that we'll be presenting in the fall. As I mentioned, our building, building leadership teams will continue. We'll be able to bring all of that back between really October and early November are our moments to talk about a full overview, a look at the current fall data, a full overview of the prior year data, and that's really also when we'll do sort of the final analysis of key performance indicators for this year when we have the comprehensive data sets to look at. Has the previous slide been shared with the instructional leadership team? So this slide was shared with our, remember we got all this information on June 1st, right? right. And so we, sh we shared it with our building administrators okay. last, was that been last Friday, and had some initial conversations there. Um, and then depending on timing, some of those who had their instructional leadership team meetings after that meeting have begun this conversation. Others will do it in August. The reality is that, you know, this is a point, at this point, it's a point of reflection. And, and really even in the spring, you don't, pacing is not something you can dramatically impact impact once you get past about the second you know trimester at that point there's not a lot you can do to compact at that level so we're really gearing this to be a fall conversation at buildings where we really you know ensure that we're reflecting on what pacing decisions look like across the board and again I like everything on the slide to, on every slide tonight I don't want to overemphasize any one point but I do share this because I think it, it, it does shine a light on just a, a place for us to take a look at a system level of, of how we can continue to support growth.
this is a bit of a non sequitur, sequitur but um, is would you say that is this something? This is probably an age old issue, even before you were able to track it. In terms of like some classrooms move quicker than others, and you try to take care of the kids that are in your group and who you're dealing with. Is there like a a plan or a overarching like you're gonna watch it and see if we need to like tell them do you understand where I'm going yes. like if we need to say you know what maybe you send extra worksheets home or something and we have to move on like where's the where's the breaking point where you're like okay we need to keep going right I appreciate Because there's people that are probably doing fine and so the, the people that are slowing down you're, so, so I, it, it is it is an age old conundrum, <laughs> and you know we've seen many solutions to it over time in District 58, and some have been very successful, and some have caused us to revamp our entire instructional program. And you know, and so there's 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 a lot of ways to approach it, and I think it, it is always for for a quality <coughs> educator at some point it's always going to be a bit of a balancing act. But I think that where we can improve on this is, and this is what we talked about at the administrative team meeting, and is making space at the building level for conversations about where are we and why are we there. So really, instead of it just being something where we check in and, and, we, and we, we look at it but don't look back, we really, every, you know, every few months, okay, our, here's, where we, here's, where the, here's where this guide for pacing has us that we should be. Are we there? How far away are we in either direction? And if we're not there, let's talk about why we made those decisions and what our plan is to keep compacting that a little bit as we go forward so that we don't get all the way to the end. When we first adopted Benchmark, our, our K-5 reading curriculum, we actually had a consultant say in, in, to one group, it's okay if you only get to Unit 6 because the rest of it just repeats. Well, that's not accurate. The rest of it actually synthesizes all the information. And so it took us a couple of years to really get back on track of, no, we, we can get there. And when we, when we work together and we look at it, we, we do see that happening. You know, I think, again, I, I wish I could show you this data in May of 2022 because I, my curiosity is, is, is peaked as to how far were we. And that's where the building level conversations will be. Do you feel as a teacher that you were that much further behind where you were the year before? You know, those, I, I don't have that information. I have one high level lens to say, this is something we should talk about more. And we need to make space to have those conversations on a regular basis so that we really are checking in. And then a building principal can meet with a grade level team and say, OK, we're starting to get to the point where if we don't make some adjustments, we won't get to unit seven, let alone unit eight at that point in May. So what are the things we can put in place? What are the supports we can do? How can we move forward? But, but it is. It's true that that balance between mastery and sequence is, is especially in math is, is very challenging because if you were if I'm if I'm a teacher looking at some of the things I'm teaching in unit four I don't teach them again and so I have this I feel this responsibility to make sure now they'll get taught again in the next grade level in a different way with more information but I don't get to teach them again and so I feel this responsibility to make sure that I've done all I can before I put that content away and so that's what that's why I really want to emphasize it's it's student-centered well-intentioned we just haven't had necessarily a way to look at this from the big picture way like we do now to be able to say those well-intentioned decisions may or may not be having the outcomes that we that we believe they would for our kids thank you I think two things too this is where having that really good knowledge of the standards and as we continue to work with everyone who's teaching math um, knowing if I leave the standard here and we're not quite at mastery will I be revisiting it later in the year in a unit six or unit seven and those types of things so continuing those conversations I think it's fair to say um, we, we have spent a, a, a lot of time on language arts and reading and those things and, and you know the first three years in math we were very very successful because we were you know really monitoring that and, and being very intentional and being and, and not to say that we, we, we're not doing that now but again it's it's always a, a great reflective analysis that we do at the end of the year you know are we overemphasizing one? Are we not putting enough attention in another one? And those are the conversations that we're going to continue um, to have. The nice thing about the ECRA system that we have, and, and Justin's done such a great job with it along with James, is we have this system where we can do these immediate check-ins, you know, three or four times a year, which we didn't have before. So now instead of waiting until, you know, the IAR results come, we're already talking about this in June and putting in plans in place in the summer and then into the fall as well. This data also helps us building by building to take a look and say, okay, if a, if a building didn't get to unit seven, which, you know, is, is this set of standards, 
how are we going to make sure those kids still get that and continue to reinforce that? So those are the other conversations that we're having building by building. So this, this is the last data slide before we move to the climate survey. So if there are any other data questions, I'm happy to take One them. of the things that I think uh, I'm observing here is uh, you and your team uh, and others probably on the administrative staff had the ability to ask this question because this data was collected, right? This pacing data, you had the foresight to want to know that where pacing was so that you could now ask this question. Uh, and so one, I just want to applaud the like foresight to like collect data that you think is going to matter. Uh, and often in education, we don't applaud ourselves for the things that we forecast, and so appreciate, appreciate the work there. And then the follow-up question, as we sit here as a board, one of the roles that we can play is, what are the things that you all need in your seats as a uh, curriculum and assessment and instructional team to, ask, to be able to ask these questions and have the data so that you can go and put together a hypothesis, see if the data actually pans out, I imagine it's possible that you, you know, thought this would be a thing and it ended up not being a thing. Uh, but what other questions would you like to be able to answer or ask yourselves? Uh, and how can we as a board then position you to be able to do that? Uh, you don't have to answer that now, but I'd love to reflection on that um, as, as we think about other resources that we as a board can provide because this is, uh, I, I work in the education space and we talk about pacing all the time and we know where our students are and aren't and it gives us a wealth of information to know how much how much we need to either push cohorts forward or where are we expecting students to be falling behind? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know that I can give you a comprehensive answer to that question right now, but I can tell you a couple of things that are, that are working for us. One is, and I, I feel like I talk about it often, but this will be my last probably moment to do it, the, the increased capacity in the curriculum department is really what allowed us to be able to analyze, to implement some of those systems, and then to analyze that data within the past couple of weeks. And so, you know, is it, will, will we need more of that at some point? Many districts have an assessment person who kind of deals with, with those kinds of things. I don't know that we're, we're at that point yet, but as we continue to expand the amount of data we look to collect, that, that, that could be a future consideration. I think the time we have for these conversations, I think that's a, a space where professional learning Mondays are used very well for teachers to be able to meet and look and analyze at these things at building level teams, at grade level teams. I think those are, are incredibly important examples of places where that is, that is helpful. And I think when we talk about where does, if we see that a, a grade level team has fallen off pace and we want to work to make some, some I don't want to say corrective action, but to, to, to get to be able to keep moving forward and figure out how to best make some of those decisions, that's a place where we've really seen our instructional coaching team come into play, where they can come in with the, the broader and knowledge of you know, multiple levels of, cu of curriculum and say, okay, here are some ways we can make some adjustments so that we can get back onto a pacing track without sacrificing any of the key components. And so I guess, you know, for right now, those are things that are working for us. And so I, I'll, I'll just express my appreciation for what we do have in those areas before it becomes a what more do you need. Thanks. All right. I'll then ask Faith to come up and talk about our school climate survey. And why, while Faith is coming up, this is uh, typically uh, Megan Hugh would give this in May or June and update the board on our annual climate survey. This is a survey that um, you know stemmed in part with the last strategic plan, but even before that. So we give this year by year, uh, just to kind of see where everyone's at. So Faith and I will tag team uh, this presentation. So welcome, up, Faith. Thank you. Good evening. Um, happy to be here. Um, as you know, the district has been publishing its uh, climate survey for, I think, six or seven years. Um, this year was open three weeks, which is normal, and it was given in Spanish and English. Um, we did not conduct a communication survey this year for several reasons. Um, one is we were launching the strategic plan. We felt that there was survey fatigue. Um, because we had just come off the five essentials and that we were launching this uh, strategic plan survey. So the original communication survey came out and was based on the last strategic plan. So we made sense really to put that on hold until we launched the strategic plan and we can um, you know, look at the survey again. Um, so we got uh, three, 1,339 responses. And so that's lower than last year, but that's back at pandemic. Um, levels. So I think that's probably a good sign. Um, and after this meeting, we'll post the results um, where we normally do on the survey page. Um, 
What I found really interesting is that the survey results were very similar to last year's, but they were inching up a little bit to pre-pandemic um, stages. Um, Ten of the questions were half a point from each other, and some of them were or were less than half a point, and some of them, like six of the questions, were minuscule changes. So 11 questions went up um, in terms of um, feelings and perceptions about the district, and six of them went down, or eight of them went down, but six, six of those were minuscule, like I said before. Um, so the biggest increase was on the question, my child's school is a supportive and inviting place for parents and guardians, and that was plus 4%. So that was, that was really nice to see. Um, the largest decrease was my child's classroom welcomes parents to classroom events and activities. That decreased 4.5%. And I'm assuming that's attributed to the pandemic. Um, we were only three and a half months into school, and, and I think people were probably feeling like, well, last year or the year before, I really wasn't allowed in the school. So I think that sentiment probably carried over a little bit. Um, because we have a long meeting ahead of us, I'm not going to go into all the questions, but just some of the themes. So we had um, 19 questions, two of them were like more of the demographic questions, um, and then two were open-ended. Um, with the open-ended questions, there were some common themes. Um, what is the one thing, District 58, in your school does well that you would like us to continue? The majority of responses were communications. And I'll tell you, as a communications person and being in this field for 30 years and consulting with, I don't know, 30 to 40 school districts in this area, that is not a response I usually see. So you should be really proud of the communications that you have here uh, and the leadership that you have. Um, so there were really high marks on communications. Um, people were really appreciated the, the openness, they appreciated the transparency, they talked about the board communications, um, and that they really felt like they were getting the information they needed. Um, the second theme was a caring and supportive environment. Um, again, that was, you know, people saw that really strong. They said they saw the schools were welcoming and supportive, and the principal and staff were warm um, and supportive as well. Um, and many commented that the district did a great job and the schools did a great job at building a community. So I know that's what we want for all our schools and all our classrooms. Um, in curriculum, again, very similar themes to last year. People appreciated the rigorous curriculum. They liked differentiation. They liked the supports in place. Um, they had positive comments on the different levels for children. Um, staff, there are a large number of comments about the excellent staff. It, it really was overwhelming. And many gave specific examples of what a staff member did for their kid above and beyond. Um, okay. Oops, let me go back. Oops. Okay. So if you notice on the themes last year, the, the bottom theme was COVID. Um, this we changed to SEL. People rarely mention COVID. It really was mentioned as an aside. Um, so there really wasn't a theme about the pandemic or any you know, uh, feelings about it, um, negative or, or positive, um, regarding um, how the schools handled it. So, but the people did talk about SEL, social emotional learning, and parents really appreciated the emphasis on social skill building. And I know that's been an emphasis um, in the district and at our schools and um, helping students to manage their emotions and their emphasis on the whole child. I've personally seen that in every classroom I've been in, um, uh, things about how kids can manage their, their anger or, or their different feelings. So um, it really is um, something that parents appreciate. Okay, for the second open question, um, what is one thing District 58 or your school could improve upon? Um, there were a few more responses than to the, the first question. Um, but what was surprising, a lot of people said nothing or I can't think of anything. Um, usually you don't see that in surveys. Um, another theme was behavior. That was, that's a continued concern um, and continued concern about bullying and what can the schools do about that. And as you know, the district is working on that um, and has a big focus on that. Um, they were also concerned about if any of this behavior, disruptive behavior, was affecting their child. And then lastly, they were concerned about safety. They were concerned about safety with the facilities. They were grateful that the facilities um, are going to change and we're going to have more secure entrances. But they also talked about safety in light of the national issues regarding um, guns. Um, another uh, theme was communications. Um, 
some people said they wanted, they desired more communications from uh, their teachers. Earlier, you know, in the comments, people praised their teachers for um, giving them information about Seesaw or their student or um, different kinds of things, but there are some people, obviously, that, that want some more communications. Um, and then you had people that wanted less communications from the district and some that wanted more. So we're gonna have to um, tease apart that information, dig into it, and see if there's any uh, themes we can find from that. So lastly, um, there are a number of comments about facilities, but there was the recognition that people do understand that there's improvements coming. So that's good news. So in light of all that, I just wanted to comment on the Gallup poll. If you can see the, the two lines and how they're diverging at the end, um, and the Gallup poll is a gold standard for measuring how people feel about public schools. And as you can see during the pandemic, the confidence in public schools really declined. Um, and so District 58's data is, is well above the national average. And like I said, it's, it's, it's really good data compared to what I've seen before. Um, so I just wanted to put that in, in context for you. Um, and I think Kevin's gonna talk yeah. about what's next. So the next steps, uh, principals are obviously reviewing this data and building leadership teams receive school results and they'll use that to inform their goal setting process. We also have five essential data um, that will be made public with the school report cards and that's also data that we, re we review alongside this data. We can't release it yet because it's still embargo, but certainly we have early access to that data and, and we'll continue to take a look at that. I also personally sit down with every building principal um, in June or over the summer and we go over the climate surveys, we read all of the open-ended comments, um, uh, both on what we're, what's going well, what we can improve on, we do the same thing for the five essentials. And then of course we will continue to post this data online uh, so the community can better understand uh, parent feedback. I think there are many positives in data. There's also things that we can work on. One of my biggest takeaways that we're hearing, and, and we talked about this as strategic planning, and so this will be one of the things that the communication group works on. There is that desire to um, hear more and more from your child's individual teacher, and how can we be more consistent across that uh, on a district basis? And, and so that is something that we're gonna uh, take a look at. But as Faith shared, one of the things that I'm very proud of as superintendent, and in Faith, I wanna compliment you for jumping in. You've done a great job uh, these last uh, several months when Megan is on her, her leave, uh, is that the public's view of education right now is not in a really good place. When you turn on the TV at night, you can see you know, all across the country, people are fighting at school board meetings, people are fighting about what's being taught. Um, we've done a really nice job in District 58 of trying to unite our community and keep it focused on the kids and our core academics and our programs, and we're gonna to continue to do that. So I am very proud that our numbers are higher, but certainly things still need to be worked on and we're gonna to continue uh, to do that. So thanks Faith or for putting that together and does the board have any questions? Questions, comments? Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Faith. We appreciate it. Thank you. That brings us to reports to the board. First up is the superintendent report with Dr. Russell. Okay. So on behalf of the Board of Education and our team, I want to personally recognize Dr. Jane Yusentis on her upcoming retirement. I know how much she loves this, uh, but Jane's dedicated herself to the district since 2001. She first served as the Herrick Assistant Principal, then she served as Lester's uh, Principal, and since 2009, she served as the Assistant Superintendent of Personnel. Uh, I'm a little envious of her and jealous. This is her final board meeting of her career. Uh, but uh, I, I really, I want to congratulate Jane on a well-deserved retirement. Um, it's very bittersweet for us, but you have done tremendous work here in the district on behalf of the students, our staff, and all of us, and we can't thank you enough. So congratulations on your retirement. We do have a little something for you. <laughs> I want to thank Member Weiner for putting that together. And again, congratulations, Jane. For the personnel report, Dr. Miller, if you wouldn't mind just putting up the numbers. Um, as we do every June, 
we are now uh, in the process of finalizing our sections for next school year, and so this will also be posted on board docs. Please know this is not the final time we'll talk about sections. We review this all the time through the summer, and then we'll revisit it in August. That will be uh, Mr. Sissel's first report to the board in his new position, uh, where we're at with all of our, our sections. But we are very proud of the low class sizes across schools. During the last strategic plan, the Resources Review Council set the goal of maintaining class size targets in 80% of our classrooms. Currently, there's only five out of the 170 elementary classes that won't be above the target. That means 97% of the classes are below the established targets. I, we've come a very long way in four to five years. It, it, everybody remembers, I'm going a little off script here, but we had combination classes where we were combining first and second grade classrooms. We, I, I was sitting in gymnasiums my first year talking to parents about their, their first grade class size of 31 and 32. I can assure you as a superintendent, that's not a place where you want to be. And so we really worked hard. And I want to thank the board. Karat, you asked earlier, you know, what can we do as a board? Being able to help us direct dollars into those smaller class sizes was one of the most instrumental things the board has done to really help with our class sizes. So again, thank you. You will notice that four of the five classes that are over the target will have students from the RISE program who are included during portions of the day. And we say portions because it's, students aren't always in there the, the full day. However, when we do have students in our specialized programs, we first want to acknowledge that. And so you will see that next to the class size numbers, but also recognize that that comes with support. Uh, often the form of the classroom teacher coming in and providing, excuse me, the RISE teacher coming in, supporting the classroom teacher. So we really do have a good balance in those classrooms. And uh, it was a couple years ago where people said, you, you really need to put the specialized students who are coming in there so we can get a clearer picture of what those class size numbers are. And, and we've done that here. But again, kids never come in uh, alone from a specialized program or supporting those with a, with a classroom teacher. And like I said at the beginning, this could change. If we get more students who are enrolled, it can certainly change and throw it over. One of the things that you see here is we still have our contingencies in place, and we, we hold those. That way, if some of these numbers do change or we continue to have conversations at the board level and we make a different decision, we've budgeted for that and we have those contingencies in place. In terms of curriculum instruction, summer school started today. Uh, I want to commend uh, Justin Sissel for overseeing that program, Lucky Wagner, one of our principals, and Mark Liepert, one of our other summer school principals. We had nearly 150 students start their summer learning experience uh, today. As a reminder, session one is designed for students who may benefit from additional opportunities to master some of the learning standards in that grade level they've just completed. This is our ESSER funded program, uh, which includes transportation for all students. That means it is free of charge for that. Uh, if a student needs help. As is typical with the start of a new program blending from 11 elementary schools, arrival and dismissal did take longer today, um, and bus transportation was not where we wanted it. Uh, Justin and his team did a nice job of smoothing that out, but we did receive parent calls, and so uh, we will continue to work on that until we get it right, and so I wanna thank all the parents uh, for their patience because we do expect that to improve. This program runs through June 23rd, and session two, which is a tuition-based program, will start on June 26th. We're gonna skip over finance tonight because we'll have a big presentation here coming. We're also gonna uh, skip over facilities. But technology, uh, we began our projects uh, last week for the summer. As soon as school got out, shipment of the necessary devices have arrived in time. That includes Chromebooks and our new wireless access points. Since we got these on time, it really does help get those ready for the upcoming school year. And I know James and his team are working really hard. I see Rod in the audience as well. And so thank you for all your work. Uh, Rod's going to be on many ladders along with Todd uh, hanging all those this summer. So we appreciate that. Special services, we look forward to welcoming over 100 students and 36 staff members tomorrow uh, to Indian Trail for our first day of extended school year, or ESY. While we have arranged classrooms to ensure AC access, uh, to, or excuse me, um, we do ask parents to still bring their child with a water bottle, uh, even though they do have access to AC in our uh, specialized summer school. We want to make sure that um, they come to school if it is hot. I know today it's a little abnormal, but uh, we are expecting that heat to come up. Um, Lauren Hartilius and Jacqueline Kadar do a great job running our summer program, and we want to thank them along with Jessica Stewart. Public relations, we're pleased to report that there were 41 Green Apple Awards given this spring and winter. Uh, that's something that I personally deliver to each and every teacher. I work closely with Faith on that uh, from the Education Foundation. Uh, and this is really for those teachers who go above and beyond and those staff members who go above and beyond, and we're very happy with that. 
We also had Distinguished Service Award, so the Foundation honored 23 staff members as Distinguished Service Award nominees, and two winners, uh, Joan Gard, longtime instructional assistant at O'Neill, and Lauren Wilson, a preschool teacher at Indian Trail. I'd like to thank our foundation, uh, especially Mia Cherma, who chaired this committee, and uh, you know, just thank them for the partnership of our schools. We're very blessed to have a great education foundation. Many districts are envious of that, and uh, we're very uh, pleased. We have a board meeting tomorrow evening, and I will uh, be sure to thank them as well for all their hard work. To close out the report, um, I'd like to thank on behalf of the Board of Education the 100 plus community members that came out and volunteered their time for two nights in May uh, to start working on our district's strategic plan. The board laid out five key areas of focus and the 100 plus volunteers, which included our full administrative team, then laid out the priorities in each one of those five areas. We are now working over the summer on development teams to write action plans to make sure that we take in that community feedback and we put it to action. We're very excited about that. In July, the admin team will be bringing our uh, updated vision, mission, and guiding principles to the Board of Education for a discussion. So we'll have that discussion in July. The board will give us feedback. We'll take that to the DLT later in August. Once we round up our development team work in um, September, we'll also take that to the DLT for feedback, and then we'll take it uh, to the board in late October for full approval. And of course, the board will be getting their updates from me on all this work as we progress. But I, I do want to thank everyone for their hard work around strategic planning. It was challenging to squeeze it in by the end of the school year, but uh, you know, I, I really appreciate all the extra nights, especially two long evenings in May. Uh, that does not go unnoticed, and we're very appreciative of the support. So that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments? Just getting back to enrollment, it looks like 4,700, give or take. Is that, I guess I always have like the number 5,000 in my head is, I guess, how does that trend from previous years? Let me pull it up here. I do not believe those numbers include our preschool, which is why you would see the discrepancy. Oh, they do. That's relatively consistent for this from May and June. Correct, Jane. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, we don't have 100% of our uh, right. registrations in yet. So we did see, Steve, uh, about a couple hundred students drop during the pandemic. Um, we fluctuated from about 4,800 kids to 5,100 kids over the last several years. And so I still think we're well within. But this number does not reflect all of our students who are registered. But this number also the, reflects our students that we know who are not returning. We don't include them in those numbers. Those students are often replaced with other students that come in throughout the summer. So we will continue to give uh, updates. But that number does fluctuate between 4,800 and about 5,100. How old is our demographic report? What's it? Our demographic report was completed in 2016 at a minimum. We do those every 10 years, and so that will be something that's coming up on the horizon. I do think we'll probably accelerate that because one of the things the strategic planning groups wanted us to focus in on was are we utilizing all of our attendance areas to the most uh, efficient or are, they, are we being efficient with our uh, areas? So I, I think that will likely be accelerated by a couple of years, but 2016 was the last demographic report. Just curious if, they, if it jives, if it tracks. Thanks. Thank you. No problem. Anything else? All right, that brings us to monthly business and treasurer's report. Todd Riffle. Good evening again. Uh, first to cover the year-to-date report, um, Things are moving along as expected. You will note, though, on prop on the revenue side, that property taxes year to date this month or this as of the end of um, May were slightly behind last year. It really has to do with the collection dates and the distribution dates by the by the treasurer and just the number of days of payment. Um, they all get caught up. In fact, we received twenty five million dollars in property taxes on Friday uh, last week. So come end of June um, and into July, it will it will accelerate up and you'll see a new report in the July board meeting that will have a, a much higher number. Uh, but that was the one piece that I had noticed uh, on the revenue side that it was trailing a bit behind uh, and that's truly just because of days as to when the distributions happen and the collections. Um, Otherwise, we're, we're moving along uh, as we expect. 
the uh, this is the beginning of the new year uh, coming up all insurance meeting uh, for the board uh, where we have the property casualty workers comp um, the surety bond renewal uh, for the next year um, and all of those fun things uh, our workers comp uh, overall was down a bit uh, however overall insurance went up and the biggest piece was property it was a 40 percent increase in the estimates of replacement cost new for items um, and that's simply purely on inflation of supplies um, that the insurance company calculates uh, if there's damage on property uh, that was the biggest impact uh, from this last year that the finishing of this year 23 to the next year 24 uh, overall the three-year average it's not been as we've been we, we did see a decrease from from the prior year um, you know we lost some of that ground uh, in this next one we still work with assured partners in uh, actively bidding those out and share uh, in a, an investment pool with ourselves and the high school district uh, the other couple pieces that are on uh, this is uh, the assured partners group alternatives uh, health insurance uh, consultants their contract is up um, and that's a three-year contract uh, they've been with the district for a number of years uh, they have been very good with their supply of data and their analysis for health insurance and, and has been very proactive with working in marketing and looking at opportunities uh, with the health uh, health and wellness committee um, also in there is a recommendation from the health and wellness committee for another two-year extension of the wellness incentive this is an incentive that the district has done for several years uh, we continually work um, have the same level for people to uh, receive up to three hundred dollars uh, but they have to do a little bit more each time so uh, it has a little bit more for this next year than uh, for 25 to get to that full level so uh, the important piece is for people to do the screening uh, we had some conversation with CHC who is our, our, our firm that does that and tallies all that up has some ideas of working with and encouraging um, more participation in the building so we'll be working on that as well um, the other the last thing we have is a special ed transportation contract it is a actually it goes it's to an eight percent but it's a two percent increase from the current amendment and that is so that we uh, can align the preschool uh, start time with the rest of k6 and we've been working on that with our special ed uh, transportation firm that has the seats for the preschool kids um, they had to work through what adds in addition of staff and buses that they need to make uh, because we will no longer be tiering that preschool with other other grades uh, so other than that if there are any other questions oh and the SASID lease agreement which is uh, us renting uh, uh, classroom spaces to SASID uh, from many of our students are included into those programs questions or comments okay, okay. thank you I just you, have one you more probably stay right there. for Steve um, we were able to look at the numbers so our current enrollment if we count the students that are outplaced and students who receive um, services from us from private parochial schools it's 5013 right now um, if we don't count the students that come over from st. Mary's and st. Joe's it's 4974 so we are expecting a couple more hundred kids to register throughout the summer. Right. Thanks to James for getting that so fast. Thank you. Oh, no problem. All right, so the policy committee has not met since the last meeting. Neither has legislative or the financial advisory committee, and neither has the district leadership team. The health and wellness committee did meet. However, um, uh, Vice President Harris is not here tonight, so I'm going to go back to Todd Drayfall again to report on the meeting on May 18th, 2023. <laughs> the uh, yes the committee met um, w a couple of the things the committee looked at was the wellness incentive uh, piece as well as uh, some uh, opportunities with uh, our our PBM our, our pharmacy benefit management firm our RX benefits and the opportunities exist that uh, looking for 
perhaps a change in that um, in that format. The district is a a self-insured pool uh, that allows us to bid out different aspects uh, and uh, as opposed to being stuck with just either all Aetna, all United Health, or all Blue Cross. So these pieces we're able to uh, to manipulate and look at and contract and bid out separately. So that is something the committee will be looking at um, into the fall and some opportunities as to when it may make sense to switch. We give up some rebates, but there's some savings pieces uh, that um, with new contract structure that we may be able to save uh, several hundred thousand dollars against the plan. Um, there's always a piece that we look at it, at disruption and communication and so forth. We've done this before in the last few years, and so that is that was a, a bit of our conversation at the at the meeting. Fantastic. Questions, comments? Thank you, Ted. All right, that brings us to the discussion item tonight: building for success, the referendum design, construction, and budget update. All right, so I'll kick it off from here, but we have several of our partners here. We have Huffman and Keel, who is our owner's representative. We have Bully and Andrews, who is our construction management firm, and we also have the district's architectural firm, uh, White & Company. So they will all be up here at different times. I know the board has met the individuals who are going to be presenting. Um, so I will kick it off with our project goals, just to remind everyone that when we do make decisions or we're getting suggestions, we always do make sure that we bring it back to what did we ask the voters for when the referendum was passed. And the following we asked the voters for, which was to create secure vestibules, provide HVAC to all schools, especially with an emphasis on the AC, um, implement sixth to eighth grade middle schools, and address critical infrastructures as we laid out, especially in that target area of years one through eight uh, on the 2014 white study. As we had our visioning sessions with the community and conversations with the board, we developed guiding principles that really help us when we're making the decisions in terms of what should this look like, where should we be putting things. Um, we're always trying to accommodate flexibility and agility, fostering student choice and independence, promote safe and sustainable environments, create warm and welcoming spaces to learn while honoring tradition in timeless spaces and what that means for timeless spaces none of us know what the future is going to hold 30 or 40 years so how do we design spaces that are flexible uh, that will meet our students needs well into the future as well as our staff so with that uh, bullying andrews peter is going to come up and he's going to talk about uh, our targeted budget and where we're at in terms of the dollar amounts where we're estimating the projects are going to come in at and then todd will briefly talk about financing remind everyone where we're at and then we're going to get into looking at uh, the drawings so Peter you want to go ahead Good evening, everybody um, yes so just a little recap of where we're at from the overall target budget um, as you will see if we go to the next slide there we go um, you will see we've got, got it broken down in, into really four s segments uh, the middle school being your largest products from an addition and renovation standpoint um, and, and really these budgets have been developed as of today's dollars, we also have escalation included within these in terms of when they're going to move forward in terms of summer of 24 for phase one, summer of 25 for phase two, summer of 26 for phase three. And these are all encompassing numbers. So these are not only construction costs, but also include soft costs, which would be insurance, contingencies, design fees, uh, FF&E, which is your fixtures, equipment, technology. Um, so this is an all encompassing overall project budget in terms of the referendum scope. Um, these were also developed based off the overall project goals um, and a guiding principles that Kevin just spoke to. Um, and really these are the overall target budgets so our, our overall intent is to work closely um, as an overall team to make sure as the design develops, we're hitting these overall target budgets uh, so we can move forward into construction to, to align with these overall budgets. Uh, the middle schools, I think are pretty straightforward. This aligns with all the over programming that's really been developed um, since the referendum passed, working um, with the district and the design team to develop the programming in terms of what the exterior will look like, how many classrooms are adding, all the interior spaces, things like that. Uh, the summer programs in terms of phase one, I think when we last spoke, we talked about what schools are going to go what. This has been finalized based off of our recommendation. 
and really um, these are based off of the overall scope at each of the schools. You know, you'll see an example here at Henry Puffer, which is a $10 million figure, versus Whittier or Highland, which is much smaller. Um, that really goes down to the overall square footages of those buildings. So Henry Puffer is about 20,000 square foot larger uh, than Highland or Whittier. So that really, you know, more infrastructure, more HVAC improvements into those schools was going to drive that cost up. Um, and then really phase two and three, I think, are pretty straightforward. Phase three, you'll see is a little bit smaller dollar volume. Um, Bel Air and El Sierra already have AC and a lot of uh, infrastructure improvement within those spaces, so that's why we recommended it going last. Um, one thing as it relates to the overall budget I think we'll touch on within the schedule is that we're looking for opportunities to um, potentially, in, for the schools that are going to be going within phase two or three, try to maximize the current electrical capacity within those schools try to move in HVAC units, window units, things like that into those schools um, without putting too much work in place um, that we would have to redo it in terms of the overall renovations taking place in summer of 25 to 26. So that's really just a high level snapshot of the overall budget and I think uh, Todd's going to talk about the overall product financing but I'm happy to answer any questions that relates to this. Trying to locate it in in that full budget document that we received. Um, yep. Yeah, uh, in there there were some line items that had the word contingency in there. Correct. In several places, can you just speak real briefly to what an example of uh, like you, you spoke to escalation, which was important because yep. that was going to be part of my question, understanding exactly how you were calculating that. But uh, the, you have a contingency line in there as well. Yeah, so these are just high level. We've provided obviously a lot of backup uh, to support these, the middle schools being consistent. Um, right now, I'll just speak to contingencies that we have. We have an escalation contingency of the middle schools at 8%. So we would really expect those at escalation contingency to go up within the construction numbers. Um, and 8% is based off of a April start of next year for those and then through the fall of 20 six for those to be completed so that's why we're factoring in that right now we do have a construction contingency within there of three and a half percent um, that would be for any items that come up during construction that would be taken out of that we also have a design and estimate contingency so as the design develops um, we also have a budget contingency of, of that as well and then we also have an owner contingency so an owner contingency would be for any owner requested changes unforeseen conditions things like that once we actually physically start construction. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Todd's going to just briefly remind everyone uh, the financing behind the project. I have the shortest, simplest slide of this. Um, as, the, as the board is aware and as the community is aware, uh, the referendum was passed in November. Uh, that is the largest piece of the funding. Additionally, there is you know, interest income, uh, which you know, the board I know is well aware, um, that is part of that process. Uh, part of that initial uh, issuance was you know, including uh, $10 million uh, of our first issue. That will be interest income. Uh, there'll be a second issue is that is needed, and there'll be interest off of that as well as there is um, federal e-rate funding that may cover, that will cover some of the wiring uh, costs and we anticipate there will be rebates and some other grant uh, and we continually will work, look for and work for uh, other opportunities for grants uh, and so forth that will be able to find uh, funding uh, in addition to those other pieces. Um, if those, you know, if, if we also have on top of that, uh, the district's uh, debt service extension base. This is the non-referendum borrowing capacity that the district has is available uh, as a backstop. Uh, because we are not using that for this initial project that is available for us, that is some of the work that we've done. When we've done additions. Uh, that grows uh, in capacity over this time frame. will be available to use for capital projects after this. Uh, but is also there if we need it um, for this as well. If there are any questions on this? Um, you, you briefly, when you were talking about E-rates and rebates, mentioned the word grant. Wasn't there something kind of preliminarily that we thought would, would fall under a grant potentially? 
Are you talking about the um, HVAC at Indian Trail and Fairmount? Yes. So we have applied for a grant at Indian Trail and Fairmount that would cover a significant portion of the HVAC. Kevin, if I'm misspeaking, please uh, jump in. We have not heard back whether or not we've received that grant. So if we were to receive that grant, that would be certainly good news and change uh, some of the, the costs. Can I sum it up at a high enough level? Yeah. Thank you. Are you not speaking to what premium bonds are? Uh, premium bonds, the, the dis when um, we issue uh, power bonds or, 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 or bond issue, um, it's it has a value of X, and sometimes you 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 sell them at a premium. So you sell a bond, a uh, hundred dollar bond for a hundred, they'll give you a hundred and five dollars back, and the interest rate adjusts. Um, it is a market condition piece. Oftentimes, depending on, on the buyer of the bonds, uh, they prefer to have those because they have a better maturity long term and it looks better on their portfolio. Um, and in turn, you can get a better interest rate than if you just sold a $100 bond. So what that does allow is a, a we get $105 instead of that 100 the initial issuance um, that we did in December had some of that allowance in there. So we, we issued for that hundred and some hundred and some odd million dollars, and we got a little more than that, um, you know, and that gives us some some added capacity over that time. It it, it is a market condition piece um, that it, it's very much as to um, if it's favorable for markets when when the thing comes up. That uh, was my quick, simple okay. explanation. Okay. Thank you. So next up, our district's architectural firm, White & Company, is going to come up. Uh, one of the things that I want to remind uh, the public, we meet every Thursday, uh, the district administration. We talk about um, financing. We talk about, you know, all of these things, design, drawing, schematics, with our architectural firm, with our construction management firm, and then also with our owner's representatives. And so. We spend a great deal of time every week and we'll continue to meet on Thursdays in perpetuity until this is all done. Uh, so again, I want to thank all of our partners for being here tonight, but a lot of work uh, behind the scenes to get to where we're at. In addition to that, when we came to key points, we did then go back and have user group meetings with all of our staff. We invited our staff members for those relevant areas that we were talking about so they could provide feedback as we uh, went through and we tried to incorporate as much of that possible so long as it met our guiding principles. So thanks for having us tonight. I'm going to be joined here by Steve Shear, who is uh, one of my colleagues, and we're going to tag team this presentation. There's a lot to go through. Um, and please stop me at any time should you uh, have more specific questions. So as Dr. Russell had mentioned earlier in the presentation about one of our guiding principles being focused around sustainability, um, for the entire referendum project, we're looking at sustain a sustainable approach, um, looking at a holistic approach for this, and looking at uh, well-being as well as um, environmental stewardship. And one of the biggest things at District 58 that you can do is reuse your existing building. So when we're looking at the middle schools and not just tearing them down and having all that material for the building going into a landfill, we're actually using that those existing uh, building infrastructure as a baseline and and improving them and adding on additions to it is is um, huge in the sustainability realm. Um, we're also looking at areas such as uh, nourishment and at both middle schools looking at the uh, additions to kitchen and serving line and, and looking at, at food choices, providing choices to the students of, of what that might be. Um, Looking at areas of indoor air quality, as we look at the HVAC improvements across all 13 buildings, um, what does that mean in order to provide fresh air into spaces and, and um, the different filters that go into um, the new HVAC systems? Um, creating, uh, looking at spaces with daylight in mind and, and providing daylight or borrowed light in spaces to bring in daylight through other spaces so that you get that sense of the outdoors. Uh, we have engineers back in house that are looking at energy modeling for um, the schools as we provide these new sy systems and looking at um, efficient systems and, and what does that mean for, for the district. Um, 
Other items that we've been looking at is something as uh, simple as uh, bicycle racks at the middle schools. Through our traffic studies, we've noticed that a lot of your students actually ride their bikes to school. And so how do we provide storage on site that they can um, provide spaces for their bicycles? And these are school buildings, so also using them as a learning tool and providing signage and display in order to, to teach uh, students and visitors and staff about your buildings. So I'm going to start off at O'Neill. We're going to start off at O'Neill Middle School, kind of high level. Uh, what's up on the screen is the overall site plan. I want to preface the, 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 um, this slide. We are working with the Village of Downers Grove, um, our traffic consultant, um, as well as the district administrators uh, to work through what the site plan is. So this is a draft version of the plan. We still need approval from all entities. Um, but basically over at O'Neill, the top of the page up towards the north is 59th Street. Uh, similar to the way that you operate now, buses pull in off 59th. We're looking at, because there are more students here, we do have to extend that bus pull-off lane to uh, gain more bus space off 59th, but then really separating out the parents and, and putting parent drop-off all the way to the back of the site, which is the south portion of the site, so they're coming down Fairmount and in, into that parking lot and looping around to drop off students. Uh, anything in gold are the additions that we're proposing to add on to the building. You saw this the last time we came to present to you. This is the overall first floor plan. The item, the uh, lines dashed in red are the new proposed additions. We're going to kind of take you through the floor plan by space type in a little bit, um, uh, looking at both uh, middle schools together and talk about the commonalities across the board. On the second floor, uh, is similar to the first floor, oh, I just wanted to mention two color coding. So um, it's based on, the color codes are based on departments and um, anything that's color coded gets, gets touched, but even those, those areas in white do get touched to some extent because every classroom gets HVAC improvements, but it's a limited scope. So you're getting life safety improvements in those spaces, um, but you're not necessarily getting full finish upgrades, flooring, lighting, uh, paint on walls in those spaces. So we're going to look at O'Neill. This is just an existing uh, exterior image of the main entrance. Uh, you can see what it looks like today. This is what we're proposing. We're looking at using very similar materials that are already in your building. So that red brick that you see on the existing facade, bringing that in to the new addition, looking at the stone that's on site and, and bringing that kind of limestone-y color uh, into the building, um, really creating an identity here at O'Neill with a new main entrance canopy. Um, we're going to take another view. This is kind of looking, if you're standing in the current parking lot, the visitor parking lot at O'Neill, this is what you see. If we look at the proposed image, this is really kind of emphasizing where that main entrance is um, so that people know where to go, how to get into the building. Also providing spaces such as benching around uh, on the outside so as students wait to get into the building there's spaces to, to sit if they're waiting for a parent after school hours to get picked up, um, areas uh, for them to, to rest and wait. We're moving around the building towards the south side. This is looking at the existing gym on the exterior. The new proposed gym um, made out of precast. Now uh, the new proposed gym is a storm shelter. So the idea behind that is you can fit all the students in the building into this space in the event of a major weather event, uh, along with staff, of course, that are in that building. So it's looking at precast with um, a stained precast banding below that uh, really pulls off the existing color scheme that's on your, your uh, existing building. Um, the glassy area off to the left of the image is the new fitness center so that you see a lot of uh, the doors that exit out into kind of fitness plaza area um, that the students can go out there and during nice weather can actually exercise outside. Towards the back of the building, uh, this is kind of more uh, that's your staff parking right now, um, where all of your building services enter in. Um, looking at now with the new addition of this, the, the new gym, uh, creating this more as an event entrance. 
Uh, so again, an inviting uh, canopy over to kind of draw visitors in, signage um, to really show uh, that it is the place that you are supposed to be at and, and want to go in for uh, different events. Um, you can see some of those bike racks off to the side, again similar to the, the main entrance, uh, which you don't see, but behind that taller wall where the signage is, um, there are some bench benches over there as well for, for um, people to sit and wait underneath the canopy. Going uh, towards the east side of the site, uh, we are looking at adding on an addition for your science wing. Um, and bringing off of that same architecture of the existing building, looking at um, what we call spandrel glass panel, where it's just that red panel above, so you can't really you can't see through it, and, the, um, and then clear glazing below, um, so that uh, you can see through, and then the brick, bringing the brick in as well. I'm going to pause for a second um, before we switch over to Herrick and see if there's any specific questions about O'Neill. Steve up here to talk a little bit about Herrick. Thank you, Amy. Good evening, everybody. So we're happy to share the same level of update um, at Herrick Middle School. And we'll start with the site plan as well. Um, like Amy said, you know, we are working with the village and we'll continue to work with the village. Um, but the goals sort of remain the same of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, number one, additional parking on site just to accommodate the additional staff and student enrollment. Um, so looking um, north is to sort of the upper right of this image. Um, so looking in the west side to expand the parking lot there, um, but then also looking at additional parking on the northeast corner of the lot. Um, that would double as uh, a separate bus turnaround um, so that we're separating bus drop off and pick up for a car pickup, which is huge in terms of efficiency and flow and also just student safety. Um, but that additional parking on the northeast could then double as event parking. Um, you can see that other arrow we have, um, you'll see in the floor plan that we now have a dedicated event entry where visitors and students can use the facilities and only have access to restrooms in the gym. Um, and then the rest of the school, including the front door of the school, can remain locked. Um, everything you see in gold is an addition. There's a small addition on the north side of the site that is primarily to expand the food service and food production and serving area we need to serve um, the larger enrollment. There's an addition at the front entry to consolidate all the administrative functions in the school, but also create that secure vestibule, which was part of the referendum. And then the bigger addition on um, the southeastern part of the building, that's just to create all the new teaching spaces we need, including uh, classrooms, some exploratory spaces, and even uh, PE spaces in, in regards to the new gym. Um, and then separate bus drop-off, but then also looking for opportunities for a separate parent drop-off. So whether it be on the west side of the site, um, where parents could drop off at the front of the building, but then also creating parent drop-off on the east side, um, and doing it in a way that allows us to queue up as many cars as we can on site, so we're not backing up traffic onto the surrounding roads. Um, that's one of the things we're iterating with the village on right now. Um, and then the last piece is um, sort of connecting actually both sides of the site. So at the north end of the site, um, getting a road that connects both parking lots just to um, better improve flow and circulation for both buses and cars. Um, this is sort of an enlarged floor plan that you've seen last time. Uh, the color coding remains the same, so if it's not colored, it's um, receiving very limited scope in terms of finishes and renovation. Um, anything you see dashed in red are those additions we just walked through. Um, but also, not just accounting for the additional space, but we need to really improve in the flow and circulation of the hallways um, at Parrot 2. So, Herrick right now has a lot of hallways that only go in one direction. Here we're creating a lot more circulation loops so other parts of the buildings are better connected and um, even creating more stairs so both floors are better connected too. Um, and then at the lower level, um, you see outlined in red is the addition there. And here you get a better sense of um, zoning off a portion of that building um, where we have a dedicated event entry and then this hallway would be given access to the toilet room, but essentially all the other doors are locked, so you have an area of the building that um, 
is only used for visitors after hours and the rest of the school remains locked down. Thanks. Um, so quickly going through um, the exterior of the building, this is the entrance as you uh, know it today, um, but creating that new administrative and secure vestibule entrance. Um, do it in a way that it's very clear where the front door of this building is so any visitor knows where to go um, when you're visiting the school. Um, do it in the same sort of material palette as the existing building, which is predominantly brick and windows. Um, some very clear signage, this is Herrick Middle School. Lots of hardscape up front um, where students can line up, they could queue up. Uh, even just thinking about some additional seating areas just like we did at O'Neill uh, via these planters which also double as some traffic uh, security features for the turnaround lane. And then so here we are sort of the east side of the site. Uh, we're looking back at these existing band room. Um, you see in the, um, in the distance the existing gym. This is where we predominantly have a lot of classroom additions um, and you see the gym addition in the background. But um, using the same material palette as the existing building, even actually the same window pattern as the existing classroom wing, um, but just doing it in a way that's contextual to the existing building, but just also looks like an addition that was done in you know, the 21st century and a modern addition. Think about daylight into the teaching spaces where we definitely need them and want them. Um, so now we're spinning around. We're still on the eastern side, but we're looking more um, southerly. The existing gym is off to the right of the screen. Here is the, the new gym footprint, bringing in some of that, um, call it more of a rust color, a little bit more orange brick here at Herrick. Um, and then also creating a canopy over that event entry just to give some cover from the weather when students are waiting after hours, after a, a sporting event. Um, but then also thinking about getting daylight into our storm shelter too. So the gym also has windows up high um, so we get daylight into uh, that teaching space as well. Um, so we will, what we want to do now is actually walk through the different space types at both schools, uh, talk about the different features and considerations that we've worked through with not only the administration but with those user groups that Dr. Russell spoke about. Um, so we'll start with the main office and um, you're seeing some 3D views of how the layout um, is designed. We <coughs> call these dollhouse views. So if you imagine we, we have a digital model of the design and we took off the roof of the building and we're looking down into these different types of spaces so you get a sense of the offices, the conference rooms, um, the work areas that are being provided. Um, but first and foremost at each school, you know, we're going to have a secure vestibule. Um, we really went into detail in terms of the proper sequence of what visitors have to go through before they're um, allowed into the building and it's really that vestibule is sort of where they're allowed into before they're met with who they're meeting with and they're vetted. Um, so we're thinking about providing things like waiting areas in that vestibule, even a drop-off area for forgotten lunches or forgotten homework. So parents don't have to go any further than the vestibule um, to drop things off. So just keeping the schools really much more secured. Um, obviously, the individual offices that we need at each school. Um, we just met with this user group maybe just a couple weeks ago before break. Went through all the detail of the filing that they'll need, the amount of space that we'll need. Um, things like the number of cots, you know, that level of detail we're incorporating into the plan. Um, but the big thing here, here is consolidating all the student services and administrative functions into one area of the building. Uh, right now they are having to be in different areas of the building depending on what campus you are. With our new design, they're going to be centralized, better access for students, uh, better synergy and collaboration between the admin staff and one location in the building. Um, in addition to all the conference rooms and offices, there's also um, staff dining and work room, working facilities that we have. Um, so not only a place to eat, but a place to work and get all the resources and copiers that you need. Things like a mother's room were being, being provided in these areas as well. The mailboxes, um, even staff restrooms. Um, wouldn't that be something available for the staff right there where they're working? Um, and then, as I mentioned before, student services, getting all those functions together in a sort of one suite of spaces um, so they can have better communication with one another and better access to the rest of the resources that the staff has as well. I, you, where's the vestibule for O'Neill? I, I stared at it for a while and I couldn't find it. Yeah. I thought I saw it for Herrick. I could see where that is, but I couldn't see it. See right underneath where it says Herrick Middle School? Yeah. 
that's where the vestibule for O'Neill is. So yeah. as you come up, you can kind of see that that. I'm pointing with my cursor like you. Yeah, I have it up here. I have it up here. Here's <laughs> the front door of the building. Here's the secure vestibule. So you're being vetted through the security. I was looking at it from the wrong direction. Okay, thank you. Sorry, thank you. Sure. Uh, libraries, you know, this is a, you know, this, these are what we heard at the heart of each school. Um, so in many ways, sort of kind of creating that hub of uh, libraries at each school. We talk about student choice and independence, you know, just providing um, lots of flexibility in terms of seating arrangements, different types of seating arrangements that students could sit at. Um, obviously thinking about the library as another instructional space, so providing a classroom setting within the library, uh, but also in, at each campus providing a flex classroom that's adjacent to the library, um, so multiple classes could sort of be used in that same area at once. Uh, the circulation desk, making sure that it's properly located with the right supervision um, and of course accommodating all the books that we need but doing um, so in a much more flexible way. You know, think about stacks that are on wheels that can be moved around, that can be rearranged. Um, so there are just considerations happening at both campuses and um, even though we're kind of at middle design we just wanted to share some sort of early design um, views of the libraries at each school so obviously we're still working out finishes this is sort of a black and white um, view of the library at Herrick um, so on your left if you can imagine that's actually the existing exterior wall of the building and now this will be an addition uh, built out to the right um, but with that one wall being um, an existing exterior wall we want to make sure lots of daylight is pouring into this space um, so either through clear stories or some skylights above, um, this is going to be a well daylit um, sort of central piece of the building. Also thinking about not just connecting it horizontally on one floor, but how can we connect it vertically so that both the, the lower level and the main level have equal access to the library. And you get a sense of just the different seating arrangements and options that are available, whether it be through furniture or actually having platforms that are adjacent to the stairs. That could also be breakout space, collaborative space, seating areas for, for the students as well. Mm -hmm. um, same library, we're now we're just on the, the main level, sort of looking down. Um, so on the right is sort of the existing exterior facade of the building that will now become an interior wall. Um, and you can just get a better sense of the daylighting in there and just the, the sense of space and the different options of furniture that will happen. Uh, likewise, at O'Neill, um, here's sort of a view looking towards what is probably more the, the stack area of the library. Um, back along the windows, we're sort of using as an opportunity for different seating arrangements for students, different banquet seating, soft seating, so um, seats along the windows so they have better access to the daylight. Um, a circulation desk that's um, center in the space so they could observe not only what's happening in the library proper, but they're actually looking back out more at the common areas of the library, which is the next view here. Um, again, some extra risers, just providing to some different nooks and study areas and seating arrangements. Um, thinking about how we could better connect the library between both floors here, so um, you'll see there's a stair that connects um, both levels right there with daylight coming in from above just different seating arrangements and um, we're just at the stage we're considering finishes right now we're going to be working through the administration over the next couple weeks on finished elections right now uh, science is another area of both campuses that uh, will either undergo an addition to accommodate the students or renovation to displace certain areas that are um, needed to function otherwise um, this is one we have a lot of conversation about flexibility. Science labs traditionally are inflexible because there's a lot of infrastructure that goes on in the floor. Um, but here we're sort of um, locating all that infrastructure that the teachers will need and the students will need along the perimeter of the room. That allows us to use flexible <coughs> furniture in the middle of the room so they could be arranged for a class setting. They could park along the um, sinks and uh, power that's along the perimeter room and set up a lab setting. So it's a very efficient and flexible use of one space rather than trying to create a classroom space and a lab space separately. Um, but also thinking about um, student breakout and flexible spaces too. So um, these labs 
will have access to these um, prep areas and student areas for breakout areas to um, even thinking about ways that students could drop off backpacks before they go into a lab setting too. Um, and then the technology and all the storage that's needed in the room, you can kind of see we're at that level of detail where we're putting in cabinets and base cabinets in each room. A uh, few more space types to go through with that. I'll invite um, Amy to sort of walk you through the remaining space types. Thanks, Steve. All right, so wellness. As I mentioned before, both main gyms are a storm shelter, but we did talk a lot about the court sizes when we met with the user group, so both gyms are gonna have high school size courts. And then for the PE, there's a divider curtain in the middle so they can um, divide the space up into two different spaces. Basketball hoops around the perimeter, a volleyball, and we also talked about providing pickleball in, in both of these spaces. Um, at both campuses, they we have pull-out bleachers that, um, for presentation purposes or uh, large lectures, can seat 800 students at a time, plus over 200 seats on the on the floor. So you have enough for for your entire student population to come along with staff um, for an all-school assembly. Um, and then you can pull out the bleachers only a few rows for for um, actual. Um, events, sporting events, and you can get um, over 180 seats um, within both of the gyms. We have the new event entrance at both campuses uh, to really separate the spaces so you can kind of isolate visitors during those events only to those entry spaces and lock down the rest of the school. Um, and then new locker rooms at both schools uh, with, with new lockers and, and changing areas as well as areas dedicated for staff um, changing and showering if desired. The fitness centers at both schools have the flexibility of ha being zoned uh, for cardio equipment but also have open floor space. Uh, also looked at providing daylight into the space and access to the outsides at both campuses. Over in food service, we're gonna talk a little bit about the cafeterias at both campuses. Um, they are designed uh, for um, multi-lunch period seating, uh, looking at flexibility in the seating. The furniture you see on the page, they're just placeholders. We have not discussed furniture types yet. It was just for scale and to make sure that we can accommodate enough students. Uh, multiple points of projection knowing that these are multi-purpose spaces um, so that you can have a presentation um, in the space uh, but also use the stages at both schools will still remain. Then off of the cafeterias uh, is the new expansions of the kitchen and serving area and we've been talking a lot about not only serving the kids here at both middle schools, but how do we distribute and create these kitchens so we can cook at the middle schools and then distribute out food to the elementary schools. So making sure to size the kitchens appropriately for that. Okay, exploratory spaces. We're gonna divide this section up into kind of three main areas. First, we're gonna talk about art at both schools. Um, so the idea of that flexibility theme coming back again, flexible furniture, being able to move tables that um, are heavy duty for art but are on casters so you can move them out of the way um, and rearrange the rooms. Looking at enough storage space for drying racks and, and uh, different cabinets to store art materials as well as providing dedicated space for the kiln rooms at both campuses. Art is one of those places we want to put learning on display, providing uh, display cases that look into the, the classroom so you can see activity going on and get excited about the, the activity that's happening in those rooms. And also have access to the outside um, at both campuses off the art room. Going over to facts or family and consumer science, looking at the spaces to provide not only um, a cooking uh, for learning, so kitchens at each of, uh, in each of the rooms, but also providing space for sewing and an instructional component about learning how to sew. Um, storage in these rooms are at a premium, so we really wanted to make sure to maximize all the wall space and, and provide enough storage to store the sewing machines when they're not being used for sewing and they're in a kitchen unit, but also uh, provide storage for materials and, and pantries for food um, and other 
items that are needed. New appliances, a washer and dryer in each room, stoves for each kitchen, uh, microwaves and dish uh, one dishwasher um, within the rooms as well as um, a couple of refrigerators in the rooms as well. Going over to music, uh, both campuses are, are looking at um, a music room. Um, so having that, uh, looking at the room and, and having a teaching wall that has, um, uh, we're dealing with, with speakers on the wall and also um, an area for collaboration, so small group collaboration of breakout spaces for practice room areas at both campuses um, and storage within the room for instrument storage. All right, those were the elementary schools. We're gonna flip over to the middle, or to the, sorry, those are the, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> those were the two middle schools. We're gonna switch over to phase one elementary schools, and the phase one elementary schools consists of Henry Puffer, Highland, Hillcrest, and Whittier. Um, all the campuses, we've been looking at secure vestibules. Much what you heard at the middle schools are being implemented here at the elementary schools. So providing multiple doors of locked doors within um, as you enter into the building to slow down as you get past one set of locked doors, you're in a secure vestibule. So as a visitor, you get vetted through a secure window. You wait within that secure vestibule until you are escorted either to where you need to be by a staff member. Um, there are places for cubbies and for drop off for student lunches or um, papers that they might have left at home. So should a parent just need to drop off something real quick, they sign in, they say who they need to drop it for, they leave it in the cubby, and then they can leave. They don't even have to get any further than that in the building. Uh, all of the elementary schools have uh, repairs and um, infrastructure improvements, including fire alarm upgrades, clocks and PA system, or looking at masonry repairs around these buildings. Um, and then also looking at upgrading the multi-user toilet rooms, so renovating those toilet rooms. HVAC upgrades across the board to provide air conditioning, but also looking at that indoor air quality at each of the buildings is being addressed. All right, with that, um, are there any questions about the design section before we continue on? There's a portion of, and I feel like I might be going backwards a bit, but when we did a Herrick uh, aerial view, you see a second parent drop-off pickup area on the east, east side. side of the building. Mm -hmm. That currently is uh, a ton of open grass directly adjacent to the building where students don't have to cross a traffic lane to be able to get to. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we're thinking about uh, student flow how do we think about student flow crossing potentially an area where cars might be going at you know more than maybe five to ten miles an hour or so? So we've talked about that in, uh, extensively and looking at how parents drop off, but also after um, drop off time or pick up time, having it gated so that actually that that lane could be used for PE spaces for and be used for physical activity without having any vehicles driving through that that road. So that could be closed, that could be closed during, during the school, school day, and we would just open it up at the beginning of the end of the day. Correct. That's correct. Where are you talking about? On the east side of Herrick, there's like a new U-shaped one that wasn't originally in our plan. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to um, yeah. so well, let me Let me give a little bit more context to that. I know Steve had talked about that as well. As we continue with traffic and parking, this is still one of the most uncertain things because this all has to go through the village of Downers Grove. One of the pieces the village gave us with feedback after just a quick review of the traffic studies, they would like two areas for parent drop-off. So the only other place that you can get uh, parent drop-off would be not off of mid -off because that's where the existing one is, but then add one off of Saratoga. The reason you see the U-shape here, is that this is what we're going to you know, continue to discuss with the village, is really trying to avoid bringing it out to Lynn Scott Avenue uh, to the south because we don't want to create another mid-off situation. Um, we've also talked extensively with the neighbors uh, at that crowd. I know you had asked a question about that earlier. We still want to be very cognizant of losing any green space because we do need this area for physical education. Um, the gating of that, though, would prevent cars from accessing that area during this school day. 
the reason we obviously want to do that is because kids during the warmer months will be accessing that for physical education. We had something very similar when I was the assistant principal of Clarendon Hills Middle School. We had a side lot like this um, adjacent to the property with Prospect Elementary and we did have a single use lane like this. There it was for buses, here it would be used for something else. But um, certainly the gate would, would help us so no one's accessing that during the, uh, the, the school day. We're also trying to preserve as much green space and not deserve the neighborhood. So here you also see to the north access to Linscott Avenue. Um, please know that that still would have to be approved uh, by the village. So if anyone from the public is watching this tonight, these are just our current ideas based on initial feedback we got from the village. There's a lot more conversations that need to take place at both sites. So this is subject to change and this is not uh, finalized. So I just want to continue to say that we will continue to go through the public hearing process with the village and do all those things. Um, but also uh, one of the things that we would do for student safety is curbing. And then if you notice uh, closest to the building, you see a sidewalk there. So students would have access to the sidewalk and families versus just getting out into the grass area. Um, and that would be obviously for drop off and pick up. We don't want kids stepping on wet grass or snow filled grass or anything like that. I'm wondering if, uh, and you might already have thought about this, and I'm wondering if the square footage of the current U-shaped drive is necessary to be that large or can we bring that U-shaped drive closer to Saratoga and leave the green space adjacent to the building? So because of the amount of uh, parent drop-off, it's, it's a volume, it's based on volume. Um, and, and being able to stack on site is yeah. really key to try to get as many um, parents to be able to stack on site for during pickup, really, more so than, than drop-off. Because drop-off, you, you let your kid out and you go on your way. Pick up, your, a lot of times they're lining up, and so to alleviate congestion in the neighborhood streets as well as off of Saratoga, that was one way to do it. Is, um, I know that it's not you're not supposed to do it, but I've witnessed it myself. The circle part when you go into the parking lot, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to leave school, and people are in that V. They're parked in the V oh. area. Yeah. Is there any discussion about making those wider or something so that? when a knucklehead decides to park there and wait for their kid, that, that I'm not trapped. I, I don't, that, that, that's one thing I was gonna ask. And also, before the, the lane works now where the proposed drop off is, used to be where the buses are. Mm -hmm. And then there was an outside part. It doesn't look like that's ex made any bit bigger, whereas it used to be on the other side of the grassy part, you know, where that's where parents would drop off. It's, it's, not, it's not much bigger, it doesn't look any bigger than what is currently there and we're going to have more students. So is there any talk about that? Because it doesn't, it doesn't look bigger. So the reason, that's why there's a second drop, parent drop off towards Saratoga. So you'd split it and however the district decides to do it, whether it be alphabetically, by last name, so that you group students together or however it goes about, like half of the parents would pick off uh, Saratoga and then half the parents off of Mida. And then buses are completely separate in that, uh, that kind of eastern part. Here we go. So buses all are the only thing in this lot right here would be buses. Um, it would be it serve as additional parking after hours for event parking, but really that would be dedicated to buses. And then here would be a parent drop off or pick up number one, and then off of Minaw uh, towards the north would be parent pick up or drop off number two. So you're so you're saying that while it didn't get bigger on the Minaw side. It got, bigger. it got bigger on the other side, Correct. so hopefully people would, okay, yes. And, and again, one of the other pieces here, um, the final determination will really be based off of that scientific data that we got from the traffic study and what the village is going to require in terms of access and, and drop off and all of that. Is that out, is the northbound out going to change at all? The northbound um, out on mid on no, that will stay the same under what we're currently talking about. But again, all where that, it's only right, you turn, you can only turn right. Yeah, you're not going to be able to make a left on the Ogden Avenue just because of the traffic. So you would have to turn right. Um, the buses being able to access access Linscott would also uh, likely only be able to turn uh, right there. Um, but again, that all still has to remain with the village. We'll get their feedback as well if this U shape is something that the village, you know wants us to move forward with, we'll have to talk about, just like you would see at Leicester or some of our other schools or El Sierra, you know, 
right left hand turns only at certain amount of, uh, or certain times during the day. I'm sorry if you said this already. <laughs> the the gray space to the north that has no there's no nothing marked there. What is that spot? Where so, what's that? What? Are you talking about all along this? Right yeah. Here? What's yeah. that? So basically, that's an opportunity for fle more flexibility. It's actually a continual drive aisle from the north lot to the south lot. You could, should you need more stacking for parents, use that lane also as additional pickup or drop off space. Um, but the intent is, is that's a, a through way so that buses can either get off of Mida or, or have uh, parents come down and go out Lynn Scott. One of the things that we also had to do was demonstrate uh, to the village, especially for first responders, to have access to the fire department, whether they're on the west or the east side of the building, that allows that access. So we are still talking about um, gating that off during the day, but as uh, Amy shared, if we're not allowed to utilize Lynn Scott, we may choose to route buses up to Middaw. Um, there, there are several options we're looking at there, but primarily the intent of that road was to provide first responders access to both ends of the uh, property to get from one to the other. We're also envisioning this uh, after school. If you notice the event, parking is down on the east side closest to Saratoga. Uh, we're still anticipating that you could have people still trying to park up at mid on, and then you would be able to shuffle them down. So that's another thing that we're looking at. Um, but definitely in this um, drawing, lots of gates, lots of uh, wayfinding to make sure that people are uh, following the rules. The, the extra spaces, the 60 additional, is that going into the grassy area where people would hide under the shade or where the kids would go for like a fire drill or something? Yes, yes that's exactly what that's doing. So that will, that's to accommodate the additional staff that are required when you move sixth grade over there and more visitor parking because we're gonna have more kids in the building. So that's why you're seeing additional parking space. And we, we took that really underutilized area off to the west of the property, closest to Pierce Downer to accommodate for that. Again, I anticipate bringing many um, iterations of this back to the school board because this all requires village approval, but all the feedback and all the questions we will also incorporate into our conversations with the village to make sure that those access roads are wide enough. What do we do if a car stalls? How are the gates going to look? All that. This is the one area, though, that does require that partnership with the village. So this is just our first glance based on some of the feedback that we've already received. Yeah, I, I look forward to hearing more because there will be a lot more, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and Especially point, in here. Yeah, to that point, um, you know, if the board wants to continue to review this, please keep the questions coming. We can continue to work with um, our architects and also with the village. We're trying to be very cognizant of the neighborhood. While we're adding students, not increasing um, all this volume by the homes, but still allowing parents to be able to get in and out and also allowing for all of our uh, buses. Believe it or not, Herrick actually utilizes less buses than O'Neill because of where kids are coming from. Uh, O'Neill has more buses, so we don't have as many spots here that we have to accommodate for busing. Uh, but certainly, um, it is a much trickier design uh, because of the number of students, but also just where it's located by the high school and then as well by the elementary school. So the village is going to be an active player in this and really, um, you know, final stamping anything that we do. For, just because I, I was a Herrick family, I just, the best laid plans and then there's people that just make their own rules. So I guess I would really push back and ask the staff who is always out there, yep. like trying to move it along, north to drop off, south to pick, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But so I think that that just that running that by staff and there would be helpful. Staff are going to be integral in this part. We also uh, anticipate, you know, because, uh, you know, later on in the agenda, we also have another administrator for Harry being approved. This is one of those reasons why we need more administrative coverage. We're envisioning a plan where you would actually have all three outside in the morning, each supervising a different area with staff members to make sure that that traffic flows. But lots of instructional videos, lots of enforcement as well um, once this gets put in place because, you know, this is going to start to feel more like a bigger middle school almost like a high school setting when you're outside and just like north and south have to have some pretty uh, hefty regulations out there for their traffic we're going to have to do the same but the, the goal is to make sure that we make it easier on our families not harder on our families and right now herrick is anything but easy when you're dropping your child off at school and so we need to continue to work through that
Yeah. Well, that's why I'm, I'm glad to see that we're putting, we're, we're looking to take a lot of pressure off of mid on, which I, I, I know we were nervous about what kind of utilization maybe the village would allow us to do off of Saratoga, but um, I mean, just from alone, I, I, I'll have a Herrick student next year, but just doing orchestra after school when we have to drop off yeah. as, as the school day is ending is, is a nightmare. I, I have friends that actually celebrated that their kid graduated, so they never ever had to go on the Herrick parking lot ever again. <laughs> right, yeah. I hate to break it through, it's not that easy at Downers North. Well, <laughs> <laughs> We are uh, we are keenly aware of the, the traffic issues, and um, again, the village of Downers Grove will be working very closely with us. And, and we are also speaking with the police department as we go through this, just to really make sure that we get it right while still respecting the neighbors. You know, one of the things we committed to when we did have community sessions, we did see people from Linscott, Mid On, Grant, and the surrounding streets come and talk to us and say they want to make sure that they're a part of that. They want to make sure that the village has a stand up. Grant brought that up as well at a meeting. And so a lot more on the traffic here as we go through. Uh, but this just, or this design is, a, is you know, incorporating some of that feedback. We do expect changes to be made to this though. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, then I'm going to turn it back over to Peter. All right, quickly just go through communication. So this is really intended to be a really, um, you know, clear and open, transparent process in terms of communication. Everything that we share from a construction standpoint, we want the community to be aware of it, uh, keep the, the board well informed. So really what we want to do is create a product dashboard. Um, this would really be managed by the construction management team. Um, and this is just an example of what it would look like. So this would be linked to the district website, referendum construction update, and as you can see, um, different buttons that the community and uh, the entire community will have access to from a product context standpoint, who Bullying Andrews is, you know, from an on-site standpoint, project management standpoint, also context from uh, down the, you know, administration, and then also from the uh, design team as well. Schedule to keep everybody updated in terms of overall milestone schedule. Uh, webcam just really give a community of what we're doing. Um, from a, a, a webcam standpoint, so everybody can have a live look of what's happening on the projects in terms of the two middle schools. Uh, site logistics to really understand how the community, surrounding community is going to be impacted from an overall site logistics standpoint. And then some visual um, 3D animation, things like that, as, as you can kind of saw. As the design develops, you'll be able to get a sense of what the inside of the space, exterior of the space will feel like. And then instruction site is really just 360 photos progress photos of construction throughout the uh, duration of construction so everybody can see that and then we'll do the same thing from an overhead view bird's eye view standpoint from drone progression uh, on a monthly basis as construction progresses um, just some examples before you we know, keep going forward for a second how do we uh, balance privacy with the webcam availability for the community to monitor progress talk more about that maybe? Um, so it's it's not live um, and then we can set perimeters so it's only focuses specifically on our build site and not um, to any surrounding areas or adjacent properties so we can definitely set the overall limits so it only focuses on uh, the product site itself. You said and it's not live? What's that? Yeah it's and it also live. has a 30 minute delay uh, so it's not it's not live. Okay. I, the thing that I'd be uh, concerned about is we're responsible for sixth through eighth grade students on those sites or seventh eighth grade students on those sites and so i'm really mindful of them unwillingly being on camera mm -hmm. yeah and I, you know this is um something that we can not share or if there's concerns with it we i mean just to know from like other projects you all have led how you all manage that yeah i mean on a lot of our products uh, specific from like k through eight um, we, we have not had issues from a privacy standpoint you really don't have the zoom capabilities to you know, zoom in on individual students. Um, this is more really a, a high level view of, of the overall project site. I think too, if you if you look at uh, Bullying Andrews, there's live examples. I, I, Peter, if I'm misspeaking, let me know. Uh, 157C in Frankfurt has one as well. And mm -hmm. uh, that was a really good um, view for me to be able to see. Predominantly, this is always going to be focused in a construction where really students are not allowed to be at. And so yeah. I think that's really going to be helpful as well. Um, but we know how our community does value privacy, and so the intention of these webcams is really just to give a view for the community to kind of see the work in progress in a similar fashion to what the village has done. I, I think that's been a really good thing, but not to really have our staff or our students on there. Uh, that, that's not the intention of that. It's really just to give an update on the construction, and um, you know these areas will be properly fenced off, so students should not have access to those areas. 
Yep. Yeah, this is just an example here. As you can see, it's a um, high level view of really, you know, before you have an addition on the bottom right, you have an addition. So, and we can make sure our, our perimeter boundaries are set only within the construction fence areas. Um, also, from a board level communication, we would have a, an executive summary at each month um, related to overall high level product update, pictures, pro progress in terms of what's happening on site, schedule update, the overall construction budget. Um, where we're at in terms of allowances that we have built into the subcontractors and then contingency usage um, so you can get an overall high level snapshot on a monthly basis um, from that. Um, so that's really the overall communication level standpoint. The only other thing from a communication level standpoint is at both of the middle schools we'll most likely want to do a community coffee where we invite the adjacent neighbors prior to mobilization um, so they are able to meet and greet our team who will be on site on a daily basis. Um, make sure that they don't feel that we've just showed up in their backyard without being informed of what's going on so we can also get feedback from them in terms of what works from a logistics standpoint and make sure that they have our contacts for any issues that do come up that we can address them immediately um, if, if they're impacted whatsoever during construction. In terms of an overall milestone standpoint, basically, um, as you can see right now, we are schematic design approval. Um, we'll really be going into the permitting process. Um, we will then be going into the public bidding process. Really, the, the first package that we would be bringing to the board is for early equipment package. This is for any long lead um, equipment, such as switch gears, rooftop units, um, things like that. Post pandemic, we really had a lot of lead time concerns, so this is the first bid package that we're going out to to it, uh, ensure that we gotta uh, get ahead in terms of overall procurement of that uh, critical long lead equipment. Um, we will then be doing um, four other packages associated with the middle school, and then each of these summers will come um, for the adjacent summers. Um, so we're gonna be presenting a total of seven times to the board for review and approval of those bids. That would include a bid recommendation that we would um, analyze all the numbers presented in terms of where we came in at bid versus the overall budget. Um, and then we'll, our intent is to provide a very detailed summary with all of the numbers at the Friday um, weekly update, one week in advance of each of the board meetings, uh, then review it at a board meeting uh, for approval. So the first bid package will actually be going out at the end of July for a public notice. We then have our first um, public bid opening uh, on August 23rd. We, we would then take about a week to review all the numbers, make sure all the scopes are covered, and then put a uh, recommendation to, you, to the board on the weekly update uh, right around September 1st. And then we would be coming at the September 11th board meeting for review and approval of that first bid package. Uh, in terms of overall construction phasing, really the middle schools, the intent for the middle schools is to mobilize during spring break of 24 uh, with an overall completion in fall of 25. There are several summer renovations that we're doing in the summer of 24, also in the summer of 25. We're also doing some mid-year renovations um, of available spaces. So at Herrick, we're, there's four classrooms that we're able to take offline during the school year to do some mid-year renovations. And at O'Neill, there's six schools, six classrooms that we're able to take offline during for mid-year renovations to try to minimize our overall time frame on site uh, and get as much work completed uh, for completion of the two middle schools in the fall of 2025. And then as you'll see, summer of 24, the four middle school, four elementary schools, four in summer of 25, and then the balance of the three elementary schools in summer of 26. Um, kind of just high level from an overall logistics standpoint, you, you, you're used to seeing this, but everything in green will really be construction site fencing that will have screening on it. What we actually like to do is put some plexiglass cut, cut out windows within those to uh, avoid the curious student to try to jump over the fence. We'll just look through the plexiglass windows just to kind of see progression of construction on site. Um, and then really we'll, we'll be limiting any construction deliveries uh, not to happen during drop off or pickup. So basically our construction gates close when we have drop off and pickup. And then um, once that is completed, we'll open up our gates to resume construction activities within those spaces. Um, we're, we're also here at Herrick maintaining the existing 
uh, main entry um, that we'll continue to do, and then all of the yellow arrows that you see are the, the emergency exit and exiting that we're going to maintain from a life safety standpoint. And we're trying to minimize our footprint um, to allow that PE outdoor space uh, to continue, continue con for continuous use during the uh, during the school year. Um, also at O'Neill, you'll see green construction fencing. Um, on the back side where the addition is, the two additions for the storm shelter and the kitchen addition, you'll see that we are still maintaining um, that drop off and pick up and exiting um, on that side. Um, so that will basically be during drop off and pick up, we'll be able to utilize that. And then um, any displaced parking, we're, we're trying to work with the YM, YMCA across uh, Fairmount to utilize that for parking during the, uh, during the school day. So that's really it from an overall site logistics standpoint. And I think that brings us to any questions. Could you speak to noise uh, for the neighbors and for students during the, during the school day and any sort of renovations that are happening? What are your experiences with that and how you mitigate for it? Um, yeah, I think, you know, there will obviously be an active construction site next to, next to it. Um, we like to understand the school schedule, so if there's any, um, you know, critical testing days, things like that will definitely limit our construction noise. And then if we have, um, you know, for instance, at Herrick, we'll be building that library space adjacent, directly adjacent to some of those classroom spaces. We'll put some um, barriers in place to try to mitigate some of that noise. Um, and, and if there are disruptions, um, that happen, we obviously need to shut them down and, and adjust accordingly. But it's it's a very fluid process throughout construction, and our superintendent that will be on site full time daily will be in close communication with the principal, um, so we can have an open line of communication. And then, in terms of noise for the neighborhood, um, obviously all the construction has to take place within the, the current code requirements, and you know, who yeah, step out of that. Right? Yeah, so we have to allow you know follow the village. Um, start times from a construction standpoint, I think we're only allowed to work on Saturdays, so um, did that as well. The one piece of feedback I know the administration is, is seeking uh, from the Board of Education, uh, Todd and I joke, we're not allowed to pick out colors at our own homes, and so we want to be very careful that uh, we, we don't make any uh, decisions um, that, the, that the Board is uncomfortable. When you look at O'Neill, really trying to blend in um, the prefab gray of the um, new gymnasium with the front there. You can see that and they continue that red coloring uh, throughout. Uh, Herrick has, and, and even if you look at the current building of O'Neill before I get to Herrick at some of those old pictures, it has a combination of um, white, red, and teal. So we'd be getting rid of the teal at O'Neill uh, and matching it with the rest, uh, the red in those places and also the, the white and gray in the other places. At Herrick, um, Herrick has a predominantly teal theme uh, right now as you go across and you look at the coping and some of the awnings and, and other places. So the drawings that you saw tonight, we would not be using teal brick. We'd be using that orangish uh, color brick as Steve talked about, but still continuing that teal theme. Um, we can certainly have conversations that the board doesn't want to have that teal theme continued, um, you know, switching it over to more of a gray to match some of the, the, the gray uh, that would be on the building. But that would be the one piece of feedback that we, we certainly do want to hear from, from the board members this evening. Um, how comfortable are you at, at Herrick continuing the theme? Would you like us to see, uh, you know, or to investigate more of a, a blending of the gray and, and getting rid of the teal? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I have a lot to say on this one, so um, I don't have a lot of opinions on this one. Well, I guess the recommendation from our design team, I mean, some of the, the things that date our buildings are, are some of these colors that have a little bit of a 70s, early 80s, maybe even a 60s kind of theme to it, depending on uh, when they were built. Uh, and now that we didn't mention it here, and I can't remember if we mentioned it in public. One of the reasons why our gyms look that way is not only did we want to create this safe storm space, but it's required under code uh, when we do this level of, of construction. So that brings in this prefab kind of more cement style look. And I think the last thing we want to do is have a, a sort of a clash of that old and the new. So if, there, if, if there's an opportunity here to sort of just streamline that and simplify it, and that's something that you recommend. I, 
I'm assuming there won't be a lot of pushback here unless it comes with a, a huge uh, dollar amount. Um, so I, I guess I would maybe defer a little bit to is, is there a recommendation if you're putting this together? What is there a negative to, to switching that out and not just trying to carry the, the theme along? Somebody can speak to that. Uh, definitely no negative um, in, in, in maintaining it. It's just um, it, it would be a scope item if we wanted to address the existing coping. It's something we, that's paintable in some cases. Um, there are things at Herrick like the existing band roof that is a metal teal roof. Um, that would be a very significant item if you want to change the color. However, we are putting a brand new addition in front of it. So the likelihood of seeing that roof um, from around the building is very slim. It's mostly areas like this existing coping here that's, that's teal. Um, it can remain, it can be painted. We've painted it before in other schools that have this teal color before too. Um, so really it's just, it's just an additional scope item and we could, we could get pricing for that separately too. And when you paint something like that, is that something that now a year and a half from now is gonna start peeling and I'm gonna see a teal underneath it? Or is it maintained pretty well when? when it's maintained it? pretty well. We have schools actually in the area that we've done this very thing that are holding up very well too. So with the overall design, does it look nice and cohesive to keep this blue theme or is this something that maybe you would recommend we get some dollars on and, and look at and to sort of bring cohesion within. I think getting pricing for it's a good idea and we have it informed. It could be even something that could be an alternate bid so that you have better decisions to make when you actually get pricing back. I don't, I mean, from my perspective, I don't think it hurts to at least look at the numbers on that. Does anyone have any thoughts on it? I'm kind of different. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think we're, we're kind of bringing this, you know, it's 9 o'clock, we got a lot more. <laughs> so maybe if it is a scope item, we Take investigate what that scope change would look like. And yep. Yep. Kind of fre fresh, uh, yeah. fresh set of eyes, take a look at it. Yeah. And, we'll, and, and then with a, with a full board, too. Perfect. We're short three today, so that would be great to see yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Amy uh, Bully and Andrew, or White and Company Bully and Andrews, and then also uh, Huffman and Keel for this presentation. It's been a lot of work. It's, it's nice to see it all come together. Um, this is, will all be posted for our community so people can take a look at it. And um, especially want to thank all of our staff for coming to all the user group meetings to get us there uh, because it was a lot and uh, we appreciate all the feedback. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, this brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agenda items or addressed by administrative staff when appropriate. The board has allocated 30 minutes tonight, and we ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit to give everyone the opportunity to speak. Uh, I did not see anyone drop off any cards. So I don't see any cards in there, but is there anyone who would like to step up to the podium and provide public comment tonight? Okay, and that brings us to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested the revisions, uh, any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? All right, is, uh, then is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 8th, 2023's regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the May 8th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 8th, 2023 board reorganization meeting uh, as presented? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carried uh, to approve the minutes of the May 8th, 2023 board reorganization meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 8th, 2023 strategic planning workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the May 8th, 2023 strategic planning workshop as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the May 15th and 16th, 2023 strategic planning workshops as presented? So moved. Second. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to approve the minutes of the May 15th and May 16th, 2023 strategic planning workshop as presented. Next up is our consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? 
right? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Olchek. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. And in this consent agenda tonight, we did make a couple of new hires. So, yeah. Dr. Russell. We made three new administrative hires. So, on behalf of the Board of Education, our admin team, I'd like to welcome the three individuals. I think they're all here. So, we have Michelle, our new manager of business services. Welcome, Michelle. We have Danielle, who is the new assistant principal at O'Neill Middle School. Welcome, Danielle. And we have Kelly Navani, who's a familiar face of current teacher at Herrick, or I shouldn't say current, uh, former teacher at Herrick, and now uh, the new assistant principal. So welcome, uh, Kelly. You've all done a fabulous job during the interview process. Your references uh, rave about you, and we're very excited to have you join our District 58 family. So thank you, and uh, we hope you enjoyed all the presentations tonight as <laughs> well. Uh, but do certainly appreciate you staying through all that, and uh, we can't wait to have you on our admin team. I think you're really going to enjoy it, and it's a great group of people that works real collaboratively with our school board. So welcome to our team. Welcome. All right, we have a couple of items up for a recommendation. Uh, first up is the 2022 uh, through 2023 amended budget. Is there a motion to approve the 2022 through 2023 amended budget as presented? So moved. Second. All right, is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to approve the 2022 through 2023 amended budget as presented. Next up is a second reading and approval of press issue 111, policy 5330, and policy 7270. Is there a motion to approve the policy updates in press issue 111, policy 5330, and policy 7270 as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the policy updates and press issue 111, policy 5330, and policy 7270 as presented. Uh, next up is a resolution of nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution for nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to adopt the resolution for nomination for membership on the Downers Grove Plan Commission as presented. Big, big uh, shoes. What? Big shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. All right, next up is the school wide writing curriculum adoption. Is there a motion to approve the purchase and the adoption of the school wide writing fundamentals as outlined in the attached quote for a five year period beginning in August of 2023 for a total price of $333,169.95? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase and the adoption of school wide writing fundamentals as outlined in the attached quote for a five year period beginning in August of 2023 for a total price of $333,169.95. Uh, next up is the Haggerty Bridge to Reading Pilot Materials Purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the Haggerty Bridge? Reading Pilot Materials is outlined in the attached quote for a total cost of $43,780.06. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of the Haggerty Bridge to Reading Pilot Materials is outlined in the attached quote for a total cost of $43,000. $1,780.06. We have a Benchmark 2022 Pilot Materials Purchase. Is there a motion to approve the purchase of the Benchmark 2022 Pilot Materials outlined in the attached quote for a total cost of $121,936.50? So moved. Second. All right. Melissa, uh, any discussion? All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. Uh, the motion carried to approve the purchase of the Benchmark 2022 pilot materials is outlined in the attached quote for a total cost of $121,936.50. We have a consolidated district plan. Is there a motion to approve the District 58 consolidated district plan for the 2023 through 2024 school year? 
So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the District 58 Consolidated District Plan for the 2023 through 2024 school year. We have a resolution appointing a school treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution appointing Todd Drayfall as the school treasurer? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to adopt the resolution appointing Todd Drayfall as school treasurer. Uh, we have a resolution approving a surety bond of the treasurer. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution approving a surety bond of treasurer as presented? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution approving a surety bond of treasurer as presented. We have stop loss insurance coverage. Is there a motion to accept the proposal from VOIA for a specific stop loss insurance coverage at a total cost of $1,894,417 for the plan year of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th of 2024? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to accept the proposal from VOIA for a specific stop loss insurance coverage at a total cost of $1,894,417 for the plan year of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th of 2024. Uh, next up is the Property Casual Cyber Liability Workers' Compensation Insurance Coverage. Is there a motion to authorize the purchase of insurance coverage as presented in the attached memo for a period of July 1, 2023 through June 30th? 2024 for a total cost of $544,903. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to authorize the purchase of insurance coverage as presented in the attached memo for the period of July 1, 2023 through June 30, 2024 for a total cost of uh, $544,903. Uh, next up is the Sunrise Transportation con uh, Contract uh, Amendment. Is there a motion to approve the contract amendment for the 2023 through 2024 school year with Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation Services? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. M Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the contract amendment for the 2023 through 2024 school year. Uh, with Sunrise Transportation for Special Education Transportation Services. Uh, SACID Classroom Lease Agreement. Is there a motion to approve the lease agreement with SACID as presented? So moved. Any second? Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the lease agreement with SACID as presented. Next up, we have the Fairmount Playground Donation Agreement. Is there a motion to accept the F Fairmount Playground Donation Agreement as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carried to accept the Fairmount Playground Donation Agreement as presented. Uh, we have the Pierce Downer uh, Playground Donation Agreement. Is there a motion to accept the Pierce Downer Playground uh, subsequent donation agreement as presented? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to accept the Pierce Downer Playground subsequent donation agreement as presented. Assured Partners Benefit Consultants uh, contract renewal. Is there a motion to approve the agreement with Assured Partners for Benefit Consulting in, uh, for the amount of $7,250 a month? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Let's please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the agreement with Assured Partners for Benefit Consulting in the amount of $7,250 per month. And last up is the Continuation of Wellness Incentive Program. Is there a motion to approve the recommendation for the updated wellness incentives as presented in the 20, uh, for the 2023 through 2024 and 2024 through 2025 school years? So moved. Second. All right. Is there any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the recommendation for the updated wellness incentives as presented for the 2023 through 2024 and 2024 through 2025 school years. 
Uh, one quick announcement, we, our next meeting will be on Monday, July 10th at 7 p.m. Uh, right here at Downers Grove Village Hall. Uh, we do not have any closed uh, meet, uh, items tonight, so that brings us to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried. We are now adjourned at 9.23 p.m.